Greetings and morning to everybody. Uh, let me begin by acknowledging the Minister of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs, Honorable Ngosa Zanadlamini Zuma, the House Chairperson for International Relations and Member Support, Honorable Wening Wenya, the Chief Whip of the NCOP, Honorable Seiso Mohai, Honorable Permanent and Special Delegates, Leaders of Governmental and Non-Governmental Institutions, the Panel of Academics and Experts, Ladies and uh, gentlemen, allow me to start by welcoming everybody to this important workshop on cooperative governance and inter intergovernmental relations, which is being held under the theme, taking a lead in advancing cooperative governance and intergovernmental relations. In making these opening remarks, I've been asked to focus on reaffirming the role of the NCOP in advancing cooperative governance and intergovernmental relations. Fellow participants, it is just over two years since the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic. The pandemic caused untold devastation across the globe. Millions of lives and livelihoods have been lost. In South Africa, it also exposed the fault lines in general and the glaring inequalities in particular. However, the pandemic has also taught us many lessons. One thing that the domain of policy making and policy implementation is increasingly becoming complex and highly unpredictable. And that greater innovation and agility are required for the attainment of policy goals. As such, more than ever, we have to strengthen our political institutions so that they are able to carry out their mandate under the ever-changing conditions. We also need to build effective, integrated, and resilient planning and service delivery systems. Fellow participants, the National Council of Provinces has the possibility to make a great contribution in this regard. This is evident because, as noted by some scholars, the NCOP code draws provincial and local experiences into the national debate when the effectiveness of policy and its implementation is considered, close quote. Our constitution states that the NCOP represents the provinces to ensure that provincial interests are taken into account in the national sphere of, of government. It does this mainly by participating in the national legislative process and by providing a national forum for public consideration of issues affecting the provinces. Furthermore, the constitution heightens the role of the NCOP in society by providing space for part-time representatives to represent the different categories of municipalities in this house. This makes it the only structure in the parliament that is constitutionally mandated to bring together under one roof 
the public representatives from the three spheres of government. Owing to this constitutional design, it is expected of the NCOP to take a lead in ad advancing the principles of cooperative government and intergovernmental relations. These principles are contained in, in Chapter 3 of the Constitution. Among other things, Chapter 3 enjoins the, the spheres of government and all organs of state within its sphere to secure the well-being of the people of the Republic, to provide effective, transparent, accountable, and coherent government for the Republic as a whole, to be loyal to the Constitution, the Republic, and its people, to respect the constitutional status, institutions, powers, and functions of government in the other spheres to exercise their powers and perform their functions in a manner that does not encroach on the geographic, functional, or institutional integrity of government in another sphere, and to cooperate with one another in mutual trust and good faith by assisting and supporting one, one another, coordinating their actions, and, legis and legislation with one another. These principles, fellow participants, sum up the essence of cooperative governance and the need to maintain sound intergovernmental relations in the Republic. Therefore, as an oversight body, the NSOP is at a vantage position to contribute to the re realization of this constitutionally mandated form of governance towards achieving the desired policy outcomes for the transformation of our society. In reaffirming the role of the NCOP in this regard, we need to ask whether the institution is indeed taking a lead in the advancement of the principles of cooperative government and intergovernmental relations. Throughout the years, this, this question has characterized the debate about the NCOP in one form or another. In most cases, the answer has always served to reaffirm and reinforce the constitutional rule, role of the NCOP. For example, writing in 2010, in response to discussions, about the need for a review of the NCOP, Professor DeForce said, quote, although some of the members of the NCOP are hardworking, and although they sometimes do engage seriously with legislation, the distinct voice and perspective of each province is lost, close quote. Ladies and, gen ladies and gentlemen, while we may not embrace the full import of this view, it is inescapable that the provinces play a very significant role in directing decision-making in the NCOP. Therefore, it is important that their voices are heard and that their interests inform the work of the NCOP. In 2009, the report of the Independent Panel Assessment of Parliament advised that uh, in its oversight work, the NCOP should be directed, quote, directed by the goal to contribute to effective government by ensuring that provincial and local concerns are recognized in national policy making and that provincial, local, and national governments work effectively, close quote. This highlights the NCOP's critical role in overseeing how the spheres of government relate with one another. As already mentioned, the constitutional, constitutional principles of cooperative government and intergovernmental relations provide uh, guidance. They underscore the need for cooperation and coordination in keeping with the fact that South Africa is, quote, one sovereign 
democratic stage uh, those codes. The role of the NC NCOP is also very critical when one looks at what the Intergovernmental Fiscal Relations Act of 1997 seeks to achieve. The objective of the act is point to promote cooperation between the national, provincial, and local spheres of government on fiscal, budgetary, and financial matters, and point to prescribe a process for the determination of an equitable sharing and allocation of revenue raised nationally. Taking this into account, it is no wonder that the NCOP attaches great value to the processing of the Division of Revenue Bill. The bill enables provinces and municipalities to fulfill national policy goals. This is particularly important in the light of the sixth parliament, parliament focus on the improvement of budgetary oversight in order to improve gov government's responsiveness and accountability. Honorable members and guests, the NCOP is the sixth parliament, in the sixth parliament, has sought to reaffirm its role in advancing the practice of cooperative governance and sound intergovernmental relations. It has done this through a number of mechanisms, including the following. Committee of Oversight, where committees have dealt with the detail of the work of government, uh, informed by strategic plans, reports, and on-site inspections. Plenaries, where we dealt with debates, reports, policy debates, and bills, and shared the perspectives of the provinces and local government. Questions, where the focus has been on provincial impact on the national development, development plan thematic areas, for example, quality of education, skills development, healthcare, housing, water, electricity, and sanitation. Provincial Week, where we directly work with our counterparts and also engage the members of the public across the length and breadth of our respective provinces to enhance public involvement and oversight work. Local Government Week, which has assisted, uh, assisted us to sharpen our understanding of the challenges facing local government and the possible policy options required to address them. And the ministerial uh, briefings. Launched in 2020, the mechanism of ministerial briefing was necessitated by the need to broaden the understanding by members of the work of government, particularly in dealing with the devastating impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Ladies and gentlemen, while the COVID-19 pandemic has caused untold damage. It has also taught us important lessons about the fluidity of the policy space and the need for innovation and agility. These lessons should guide us as we seek to achieve better policy outcomes through throwing in local and national experiences in national debate. The NCOP has a huge role to play in the promotion of the principles of cooperative government and intergovernmental relations that are contained in Chapter 3 of the Constitution. Over the years, scholarly critics have sought to reaffirm and reinforce this role. What is clear is that the, in conducting its work, the NCOP must be guided by the interests of the provinces and must also concern itself with local government issues. During the course of the sixth term of parliament, the NCOP has used certain mechanisms to pursue its mandate. These include the ministerial briefings, which were launched in 2020 as a way of further equipping members with the tools to engage the executive. In doing this work, we had to adapt our methods given the constraints imposed with lockdown measures to fight the COVID-19 pandemic. The House of Chairperson uh, for Committee 
committees and oversight, Honorable Nyambi summed up this effort when in delivering his final report uh, in the program committee last December, when he said, and I, I quote, looking back where we started, especially under COVID-19 conditions, it is safe to say we have covered distances which we did not know existed. The learning process has not, has not stopped. We learn new lessons every day, close quote. Participants and fellow colleagues, I hereby welcome you to the workshop. And I'm looking forward to fruitful deliberations that will assist us to progress further. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Having uh, done the opening remarks, we will now move on with our, our program. Uh, perhaps I should just, just indicate that please note that uh, from 12.30 to uh, 1300 hours, uh, Ms. Avril Williamson has been moved up, uh, uh, and there's a new uh, speaker, Ms. Zelna Johnson, or Janssen. Uh, uh, this is a case as well in relation to the afternoon uh, between 14.20 to 15.30. Uh, 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 there's the replacement there of Professor Harit van der Waard by Professor Chris uh, Tepscott. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I will now take this opportunity uh, to call on uh, uh, Honorable Dr. Ernest Lamini Zuma, uh, the Minister of Cooperative Government and Traditional Affairs, to give us a keynote address advancing the fundamental precepts of cooperative governance and intergovernmental relations for effective service delivery to communities. Honorable Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson of the NCOP. Let me greet the Deputy Chairperson of the NCOP, the Premiers present, the MECs present, the Chairperson of the, mem of the Select Committee and members of the Select Committee on Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs, the Deputy Ministers, for cooperative governance and traditional affairs, as well as other deputy ministers that may be present, honorable provincial whips, delegates from the provinces, members of provincial executives, chairperson of the municipal demarcation board, the acting secretary in parliament, the secretary to the NCOP, the auditor general, Directors General of the Departments. I'd like you, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to participate in this workshop. This workshop is very important, especially having just emerged from our six peaceful democratic local government elections. And this session offers us an opportunity to provide a frank and honest reflection on the state of governance, intergovernmental relations in our country. And in considering uh, the state of government and performance of the state and its constraints, we must not be oblivious to the objectives and objective and subjective 
a realities that we face. Of course, the, the, the chair of the NCOP has spoken about the realities brought about by COVID-19, so I won't dwell on them. And then the realities confronting both South Africa and the developing world confirm to us that our nations have not been entirely freed from the bondages of colonialism, apartheid, racism, sexism, and inequality. As we reflect on those realities, let us recall the words President Mandela at his inaugural summit as head of state at the Organization of African Unity when he said, and I quote, if freedom was the crown which fighters of liberation sought to place on the head of Mother Africa, let the upliftment, the happiness, prosperity, and comfort of her children be the, be the jewel of the crown of those goods. Now we have to ask ourselves whether indeed that jewel on the crown is what Mandela, President Mandela, uh, envisaged. Have we reached the upliftment, the happiness, the prosperity? and the comfort? My answer would be, no, not yet. We, we are not there yet. We are, we've done a lot, but I wouldn't say we've actually uh, reached that level. But let me say, two years after our president had uttered those words, the Constitution of the Republic was adopted. And the South African Constitution it was established as the supreme law and the cornerstone of democracy of our land. Thus, the Constitution contains fundamental precepts, which include enshrined rights that affirm democratic values, such as equality, and freedom. It also elaborates on the obligations that citizens themselves must uphold in allegiance to our country and the Constitution. These obligations, we as public representatives have had to reaffirm at the beginning of each term of office. Like all citizens who are expected to live by them as we discharge our various mandates and tasks. Overall, these obligations reaffirm that we shall be good, ethical, accountable, loyal, and patriotic citizens and representatives. Therefore, we are obliged to obey the laws of our country whilst ensuring that others do so. We must also contribute in every possible way in making South Africa a pleasant place to live in, to make sure it's prosperous and peaceful. And as not to, to say our constitution is perfect. In fact, with implementation, Many flaws or shortcomings are identifiable. However, it does establish the basis and architects by which our nation can pursue the superordinate objectives to improve the quality of life and free the potential of each person. Through its carefully crafted and complex cooperative governance framework, it recognizes that these objectives will require collective and individual actions by multiple actors. 
These actors include the three arms of the state, that is the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary. And also the three spheres, which are national, provincial, and local. It also pays tribute to our cultural heritage and recognizes the institution of traditional leadership and our customary law as important contributors to a vibrant democracy. Consequently, the executive arm of the Republic is constituted as national, provincial, and local spheres of government, which are distinctive, interdependent, and interrelated. And of course, chapter three of the Constitution, which deals with the cooperative governance, guides us in terms of how government should cooperate. Section 41.1 outlines these principles of cooperation, which says that each sphere. Now, the chairperson of the NCOP in his introduction read out these principles. So I'd also written them out, but since he has read them out in full, I probably won't repeat. But they are very important because they are really the the, the guide that the Constitution gives us on how cooperative government should be. And I think I want to just stress one or two, which says that the, the spheres should not assume any power or function except those conferred on them in terms of the constitution and exercise those powers and perform their function in a manner that does not encroach on their geographic, functional, and institutional integrity of government in another sphere. And cooperate with one another in mutual trust in good faith. So these are the principles. And we make this point also because we find that sometimes there's confusion about what the national can do at a, in a province or in a municipality at the local sphere. And sometimes there's expectation that national can just intervene anyhow uh, in a municipality. The executive cannot do that. It has to follow the guidance of the constitution. But of course the constitution does give more powers to intervene at a provincial level to the national through section 100. But it also has a very detailed section 139 that guides the province, the executive, the province to how it should intervene in the local sphere. But in doing so, of course, it does say that it should consult the minister responsible for local government, as well as the provincial legislature and the National Council of Provinces. So there can be no intervention, both in the province by national or in the municipality by the provincial sphere without the NCOP concurring to that intervention. 
but also without the NCOP overseeing that intervention. And I want to just also talk a bit about local government itself, because the constitution spells out very clearly what the duties and objectives of local government are. And they are very important in terms of the topic we are discussing, because the topic we are discussing includes service delivery in a sustainable manner. So the constitution says local government uh, objectives are to provide democratic and accountable government for local communities, to ensure the provision of services to communities in a sustainable manner, to promote social and economic development, and to promote a safe and healthy environment to encourage the involvement of communities and community organizations in matters of local government. And it goes further to say a municipality must strive within its financial and administrative capacity to achieve the objectives set out in step section one. These are very serious responsibilities for the <coughs> local government, because all communities in the, in the Republic are local. There is no community that is provincial or national. So every community has to be looked after by local, the local sphere. And I think that the Constitution recognizes how big this responsibility is and how serious this responsibility is. And it is for that reason that it also says in Section 154, mandates the provincial and national governments to support the local sphere. And it calls on the national government and provincial governments by legislation and other means to support and strengthen the capacity of municipalities to manage their own affairs, to exercise their powers and perform their functions. So clearly, all of us, all the spheres, in part exist to ensure that the local sphere functions and functions well. What we must therefore ask ourselves and resolve during this strategic session of the NCOP is whether we have adequately capacitated the legislatures for them to efficiently undertake this oversight function. Do we have the verification, monitoring, and evaluation system and capacities which also can act as an early warning mechanism? We can no longer wait until the wheels come off only to react. We must develop proactive systems which must positively impact on the service delivery and governance. We must also ask ourselves whether the, the local government financially is, is capacitated adequately is the equitable share to local government a fair share compared to the work they have to do? And also in relation to the fact that some of the municipalities do not have a revenue base at the moment from which to raise resources. So I think all of us should work together um, and really answer these questions and try and work together as national, provincial, and the NCOP 
to ensure that local government does get a fair share of the resources of the country since the constitution allocates to it such important responsibilities. Honorable members, allow me also to elaborate on the allocated roles and functions between the spheres of government in the system of cooperative government, all of which require the oversight of the NCOP and the various legislatures. The constitution delineates public functions into two categories, those that are concurrent and those that are exclusive. Concurrent functions are those that are shared amongst the three spheres. Thus, each sphere has responsibility in developing policy, legislation, administration, and monitoring and monitoring performance. Schedule four of the constitution leads the function, functional areas of the concurrent national and provincial legislative responsibilities and competencies, some of which include education, health services, social welfare services, housing, agriculture, amongst others. In relation to those functions, national government generally takes the lead in formulating policy, determining regulatory frameworks, setting norms and standards, and monitoring overall implementation. Provinces, on the other hand, are mainly responsible for implementation in line with the national determined frameworks. All local government functions listed in Part B of Schedule 4 and 5 of the Constitution are concurrent functions. In all instances, either national or provincial may regulate how municipalities exercise their executive authority in relation to those functions. Exclusive functions are those functions that a single sphere has absolute responsibility for developing policy legislation in and monitoring performance. The constitution does not define the exclusive functions of national government since it is responsible for all government functions that have not been specifically assigned to either provincial or local. But of course, national government has some exclusive responsibilities, for instance, for defense, national defense, national fiscal policy, foreign affairs, home affairs, criminal justice system in some areas, higher education, and certain administrative functions. In turn, the provinces have exclusive legislative competencies over the functions listed in Part A of Schedule 5 of the Constitution, which include, but not exclusively, not provincial roads, ambulance services, provincial planning. Part B of the section also elaborates on the functions related to local government, which should be read together with Section 155 of the Constitution. However, national government may legislate in these exclusive provincial and local functions if it is necessary to maintain essential national standards and norms for reasons of national security or for reasons for national security. Most important section 154, as I said, calls on national and provincial government not necessarily to compromise or impede the municipal's ability and right to exercise powers or to perform functions, but instead to support it, to be able to exercise its powers and perform its functions. So the status of municipalities 
is constitutionally entrenched and the powers and functions, including matters such as municipal planning, are constitutionally protected. This means municipalities have the right to govern the affairs of their communities subject to national and provincial legislation as provided for in the constitution. The Municipal Systems Act of 2000 states in section three that municipalities must exercise their executive and legislative authority within constitutional systems of cooperative government as envisaged in section 41. The act further states that the purpose of effective cooperative governments, organized local government must seek to develop common approaches to local government as a distinct sphere of government. To enhance cooperation, mutual assistance, and sharing of resources amongst municipalities. Find solutions for problems relating to local government generally, and facilitate compliance with the principles of cooperative and intergovernmental relations. Honorable members, it goes without saying that the local sphere will require the inputs of other spheres and sectors to achieve this. And therefore, Section 41 of the Constitution introduces the principle of intergovernmental relations which acknowledges integrity as the core of its sphere of government. And it calls on us to collectively ensure that these spheres of government cooperate with one another. These complex and interdependent relations amongst various spheres of government include the coordination of public policy, sustainable development, and resources amongst national, provincial, and local government. The constitution therefore envisages a set of formal and informal processes, as well as institutional arrangements and structures for bilateral and multilateral cooperation within and amongst the three spheres of government. Section three of the Municipal Systems Act 2000 further re-emphasizes that the national and provincial spheres of government must not compromise or impede the municipality ability to and the right to exercise their legislative authority. The interdependent relations framework Intergovernmental Relations Framework Act of 2005 seeks to formalize this cooperation in the three spheres of government. The act aims to provide a framework for the national, provincial, and local governments, as well as all other organs of state, to facilitate coordination towards coherency and the provision of quality services and development. This is to be enhanced through monitoring, implementation of policy and legislation, and the realization of national priorities. However, the truth is that despite the complex framework, coordination, cooperative governance, and intergovernmental relations have not fully delivered the intended outcomes. This has often led to substandard delivery of services and non-fulfillment of the aspirations of our people. There are some discernible lessons of universal application which we have gathered. And I'll share those with you. Firstly, we have gathered that some of the problems local government are political and they manifest themselves in the political and administrative interface that is inappropriate, 
So it means that all of us political parties across the benches have the responsibility to educate members in the executives and legislators, in the ethics of government, and where they falter, we must act and act fast. We also have the obligation to urgently professionalize our public services. Such a public service requires that we change the attitude and behavior of public servants whilst ensuring that they are in possession of the necessary education and skills. But this also goes for the public representatives. They must be the servants of the people. They must be responsive, compassionate, and have a caring attitude towards communities. But in trying to professionalize the public service, we are working closely with the Department of Public Service and Administration, the Public Service Commission, and the National School of Governments, so that we may have a capable, capacitated, and ethical uh, state. With the Commission, we have also recognized the importance the important role of institutions of traditional leadership. Thus, we are exploring a targeted, targeted skills enhancement program for them. We have also learned that even the provincial and national spheres do not always possess the necessary skills to accelerate and sustain development in those areas. For instance, although we know that corruption and maladministration have much to do with the death of economic opportunities in, in the local areas, the national response teams, provin provinces, and local government have no economic and development planning capac capacities and experiences. Moving forward, and to sustain our intervention, we must have economic and developmental planning expertise. To ramp this up, working with the School of Government, we explore partnerships that can favor us with such expertise as we intend to center local economic development in the future strategies for local government. Another lesson that we have drawn is that we believe that the entire state and its organs not to be in possession of appropriate tools and systems to evaluate, monitor, and provide the necessary oversight. Such as systems would be predictive and thus would sense, serve to, in real time, early warning system. This none of us possess. So that our responses can be appropriate and proactive. This means that even the teams we put together for responses would be appropriately skilled and capacitated to maximize on the effect of the interventions. So far, our responses have been knee-jerk with insufficient scientific analysis and sometimes without the appropriate skills. Often our response uh, sometimes can be likened to hitting a fly with a hammer and trying to stop a flood with a bucket. And so we need to strengthen those systems and capabilities so that we can monitor and evaluate and intervene appropriately and proactively. Of course, we have begun to dis discussions with other sister departments like National Treasury, Department of Planning and Monitoring and Evaluation. However, we also believe that we must 
mobilize other sectors outside government, including academia, business, and other people in, in non-governmental organizations, because we think that work in local government should not only be undertaken by government alone. Our observation also have led us to review the strategies and organizational structure of our department. This was prompted by overall observation that the culture departments are small and sometimes not adequately capacitated to fulfill their support and oversight function role. They are often reactive without proactive measures and programs. But also, as the national de department, we tend not to have people in the provinces, at least near local, near the local sphere. So we want to change our organizational structure so that we can be more decentralized because our work is actually on the, should be on the ground not at the national offices. So we are uh, changing our structure. We hope that uh, it will be accepted so that we can implement it. And also sometimes we find that the staff complement does not match in skills and quantum the expected mandate. So we have also noted that the overlapping mandates, functions, and expectations with regards to culture departments and the offices of the premier, especially as it relates to municipalities. This is a matter we intend to pay greater attention to as we undertake the 21-year review of local government, in which we hope parliament that includes the NCOP will be an active participant in reviewing local government so that after 21 years, we can see what needs to be changed, what needs to be strengthened, what works, what doesn't work. We also hope this work will also be supported by the ongoing work we are undertaking in implementing the Structures Amendment Act. And of course, the Structures Amendment Act, amongst others, contain a revised code of conduct of, for councillors and includes the regulation of political administration, administration interface. In building a capable and capacitated state, this will be complemented by the Intergovernmental Monitoring Support and Intervention Bill. The bill will facilitate for multi-sphere support to the municipalities whilst regulating interventions in vulnerable and underperforming municipalities. This bill includes including accompanying comprehensive regulations it has to be finalized as extensive stakeholder consultations have been undertaken, including joint interventions, roadmaps, road shows led by Deputy Minister of Finance and Deputy Minister of Culture with the Premier's offices and MEC provincial quarters and treasuries. The bill also received the attention of several intergovernmental forums, including lots of MinMEX, transport, environment, human settlement, water sanitation, and sanitation, the National Economic Development and Labor Council, NEDLEC, 
The bill has been consulted with the local government unions. In December, we submitted the bill to the Department of Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation for the Socioeconomic Impact Assessment Certificate, as well as the state law advisors for the Constitutional Compliance Certificate. And as soon as we receive this, uh, and it's our sincere hope that we'll receive them soon, then we will put the bill to cabinet and eventually it will come to the to parliament. Honorable members, third lesson we've gathered from our uh, work in local government is that there is a decay of municipality infrastructure. And infrastructure has not been maintained or repaired for many years. And the municipalities are not putting sufficient funds to do this. But also, we have also learned that some of the internal workings of municipalities do not favor consequence management. And so sometimes workers are victimized for blowing the whistle. And in fact, recent research by the Public Service Commission and the Human Science Research Council have come to the conclusion that it's not really that um, the public service generally is bloated, but that there is lack of full utilization of the human resource capacity within the public service due to misalignment of skills, long suspensions, and victimization. This therefore brings to the fore the urgent need to implement the long outstanding decision on the single public service. In this regard, the Minister of Public Service and Administration intends to bring before Parliament amendments to the Public Administrative Management Act, PAMA, which we hope will receive your support. These amendments intend to facilitate for the transfer of skills across spheres of government and institutions if operationally justified to improve operational efficiencies, state capacity, and service delivery. This redeployment and realignment of skills ought to be complemented by well-coordinated, integrated implementation model. Unfortunately, the current planning and implementation in silos have resulted in substandard service delivery. Therefore, looking at what local government is supposed to do, We don't think that it is fair to apportion service delivery to communities only to local government. Think service to communities must be the function of the entire government, all the three spheres. Though the constitution says it's local government, but we think it should be every sphere's responsibility. Because you find that in communities, there are roads with potholes, at roads that are slippery, not, you can't drive on them. You find lots of other, you find that there's no water. Because there's no water source, there's no dam from which the, the municipality that is the water authority can draw water. And sometimes they end up putting pipes with no, with, with, with no source, which is wrong. 
And so we all have to work together. And hence it makes sense to have the, the district development model that will mean that means that all of us have to implement at the local level. We all have to work together at the local level. We spend a lot of resources in government. But when we work in, in silos, we don't make the necessary impact on the ground. And therefore, we want to ensure that we plan together, we implement together, and we monitor and evaluate together. But of course, this is not just for government alone. It's also for other stakeholders. Because as I said earlier, we want to center the local economic development in the strategy. So we also need business, we need non-governmental organizations, but we need communities themselves to participate. And we need other traditional leaders, religious leaders, other stakeholders to participate so that government does not think that the community needs this or cares. They know what communities are prioritizing and they know what to deliver together. So we hope all these things will also be enshrined in the 21 year review that is underway. And we hope that we can also institutionalize the district development model way of working so that it's not a nice thing to do, but it's a must thing to do. And also through the municipal support agency, we also assist the municipalities with developing their infrastructure asset management plans. And 10% of MIG grants have been ring faced for urgent repairs and maintenance of water waste infrastructure. So this is a new development that we welcome because before it was just left to the municipalities whether they do or do not put money aside for maintenance and repairs. So we hope that as we work through the DDM, we can also ensure that the NCOP will be is supportive and also uh, in its oversight also takes this into account. But let me also say that we must also not forget that we are the major principles of our constitution is also a non-racial, non-sexist society. Because we see that the non-sexist part seems to be sometimes ignored. The constitution has an equality clause, but this equality clause has not quite seen a light of day in all the areas. In some few areas we have seen, for instance, we've seen that the speakers um, are 53.8% female, which is good because it's proportionate to, to, the, to the population of women and men. So that's good. But in other areas, that has not been met, even the 50. 50 that the constitution envisages has not been met. And even, even in the legislature, the 50-50 has not been met. And I think these are some of the things that we must look at and make sure that they happen. But 
Before I conclude, I must also just emphasize that to have sustainable service delivery at local level, we must have local economies. We must build local economies. A local government should not be the only employer. Because once local government is the only employer and businesses in that municipality only can do business with um, local government except retail, then it's a recipe for disaster. Because then everyone wants to be in local government or to have a friend in local government, a business which will try to interfere in making sure who becomes the leadership of local government. So it's very important, even for sustainability and stability of local government, that we must have economic local development. And of course, also for the metros and the big cities, it's very important that there is rural development, there is economic development in all the municipalities. Because if not, people will be forced to go to the big cities and the metros. Not out of choice, but out of desperation. And when they get there, they will not find the green pastures they were looking for. They will swell the ranks of the urban poor. And of course, the metros also will not have planned for them. And then they also get disorganized. And so nobody wins. So it's very important that we all ensure that there is local economic development. And of course, by recognizing the fundamentals of our a whole of society and government approach premised on the principles of participatory de democracy, we believe that the crown jewel President Mandela spoke of will be realized. Without you, we cannot ensure that that jewel shines into the distant future and brings about sustainable, connected, cohesive, vibrant, and climate-smart communities, which is what the people of South Africa want and yearn for. I thank you. Thank you very much, um, Minister. Um, I, I guess what, what, what this does is to remind us uh, uh, from the side of the uh, uh, the team that's managing the, the, the program and then the background, Arbukit Pindela and his team, uh, on, just on the need to, to share this information uh, and, 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 and really ensure that uh, 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 this is not lost, but it's put to, it's put to good use. Uh, so let's thank the minister for uh, the presentation, very, very good presentation, um, and, 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 and really... Uh, uh, commit to ensuring that the information is shared amongst all of us, uh, that we indeed uh, uh, emerge at the end of uh, these, two, these two days uh, a better, better informed uh, and better prepared to, to take the work that needs to be done uh, forward. So thank you very much, Minister. Uh, uh, and, and without any waste of time, Having noted the, the input, we will now move on to uh, uh, Andrew Siddle, Dr. Andrew, Andrew Siddle, uh, from the University of Cape Town College of Ac Accounting, on the principles, meaning, and application of underpinning, uh, application of underpinning cooperative, cooperative governance and intergovernmental relations uh, in, in South Africa. 
Uh, 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 Dr. Siddle, I'm told, will also share uh, the, the, this part of the input uh, uh, with uh, Dr. D. Muhale from the Debian University of, of, of Technology. Uh, uh, Dr. Siddle? Chairman, good day to you. I'm here. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairperson, and uh, good morning to all of the participants. It's always a pleasure to uh, share thoughts and experiences on matters of common interest, particularly our system of government in South Africa. Now, the purpose of this address is to introduce the concepts of intergovernmental relations and cooperative governance to examine the essential underlying principles and to place them in the constitutional and legislative context in South Africa. But first, it would be helpful and informative, I think, to take a global view on multi-level government and then to focus on South Africa. Now, let's kick off by looking briefly at what we understand by cooperative government and intergovernmental relations. Uh, let's just call it IGR for short. Now, whether there is actually any difference between the two is subject to some debate. The conventional wisdom is that there is indeed a conceptual difference between cooperative government and IGR. Cooperative government is a fundamental philosophy of government or a constitutional norm that governs all aspects and activities um, of government and includes, and this is the really important part, the deconcentration of powers to other spheres of government and encompasses the structures of government, as well as the organization and exercising of political power. It is specifically concerned with the institutional, political, and financial arrangements for interaction among the different spheres of government. Intergovernmental relations, or IGR on the other hand, is one of the means through which the values of cooperative government may be given both institutional and statutory expression and may include executive or legislative functions of government. Now, at this point, I, I have to make a confession. I've always been a bit puzzled by why our form of government has been characterized as cooperative government. When we get down to brass tacks, the architecture of our form of government is probably more conventionally and conveniently characterized as decentralized government. And that is how most of the rest of the world would characterize it. But for some reason within South African government circles, it seems that the term decentralization is studiously avoided. Even our constitution does not use the word decentralized once, if, if I remember correctly, even though the architecture which it describes is precisely that of a decentralized government. Now, perhaps there's some ideological reason behind this, but in any event, in order to understand how government in South Africa works, and in particular, in order to understand the concepts of intergovernmental relations and cooperative government, it is necessary to understand what decentralization, and this, as I say, is the globally accepted terminology, is all about. So whilst I don't intend to launch into a full-blown lecture on decentralization, I think that it's important to spend, uh, with your permission, of course, um, just a little time looking at some of the basic elements of decentralization. Now, since the 1970s, or perhaps even earlier, decentralization has become one of the most predominant themes around the world in the field of governance. There's been an overwhelming move towards the decentralization of government by the granting of new powers, functions, and resources to local and regional governments, something which has brought subnational governments to the forefront of politics. There are any number of definitions of decentralization, but as good a definition as any is that it is the devolution of powers, functions, responsibilities, and resources from the national government to subnational governments. Now, it's generally considered that there are three types of decentralization. First, we have administrative decentralization, which is the process whereby the authority to administer and execute powers and functions, and by implication, the responsibility to deliver services is transferred from national to subnational governments, thereby resulting in a deconcentration of powers. Secondly, 
We have fiscal decentralization, which is the process whereby revenues of the central government and also the power to raise revenues from local sources are transferred from national to subnational governments. And then we have political decentralization, which is the process whereby subnational governments, which are elected by local participants, are established within a constitutional framework and granted political power and authority to govern over particular geographical areas and usually in regard to specific functions. In short, it's the transfer with a whole or partial of political power and authority from central to subnational governments. And therefore, and this is of crucial importance for present purposes, it involves the balancing of the exercise of power between various levels of government. Now, countries may choose a decentralized model for many reasons. The list of objectives of decentralization is potentially endless, but some of the objectives which are more commonly encountered include uh, promoting democracy, promoting legitimacy, promoting public participation, promoting developmentalism, which is a crucial char characteristic of a South Africa's agenda, for, for improving communications, perhaps even diffusing conflicts, and probably the most commonly cited reason is for bringing government closer to the people and promoting responsive and efficient service delivery. Now, just as there are many objectives of decentralization, the challenges to decentralization processes are also many and varied. Some of the more common challenges, and here I must mention uh, that these again are from a global perspective and not necessarily from a purely South African perspective, include the following. Firstly, you could have uninterested, inertia-bound and overwhelmed central governments which lack the focus, energy and resources to effectively implement decentralization policies. You also have the phenomenon of elite capture, where local governments are captured by local elites who divert and distort public programs to benefit themselves at the expense of poor citizens. You often find in countries which embark on decentralization experiments that there's a lack of political will at all levels. And then again, in many countries, particularly in developing countries, you have the ever-present problem of capacity constraints. And related to that, of course, you have financial constraints. And finally, the, the challenge which is of particular interest for purposes of our present discussion is the problem of intergovernmental tensions between the various levels of government over issues such as funding and the powers which those levels of government are supposed to uh, enjoy. Which leads us neatly to the main focus of our topic and the principal focus of this address. Now, as we alluded to earlier, decentralization is in essence all about the shifting of powers and resources from one level of government to another. Now, it's inevitable that this shifting of resources and powers will, in the absence of appropriate systems and mechanisms, lead to a greater or lesser extent to competition, confusion, confrontation, and conflict. Now, the potential for these four Cs, let's just call them, to occur becomes even greater when, there are when the different levels of government or institutions within these levels are controlled by different political formations, such as different political parties or factions of parties. Hence the need for a framework to promote a different set of four Cs. So here yeah, we're talking about clarity, consensus, cooperation, and collaboration. And this framework should be one that accommodates and manages interdependence, geographical and so social diversity, competition for resources and influence, as well as ensuring ongoing social progress. Now, the term intergovernmental relations has been variously defined, but in essence it refers to the interdependent relationship amongst the various levels of government in a notionally decentralized system, as well as the coordination of public policies between those levels. The concept incorporates various components 
of the governance, administrative and fiscal arrangements established between these various levels, including legislation and regulations, instruments such as guidelines and mechanisms for monitoring and communication, structures such as forums, processes such as budgeting, other fiscal arrangements, capacity building and support, which obviously is absolutely crucial, and then also dispute resolution procedures. Intergovernmental relations are therefore a set of formal and informal processes, as well as institutional arrangements and structures for bilateral and multilateral cooperation within and among the different tiers in a multi-level or decentralized system of government. Now, it may be said that a system of IGR has several objectives or strategic purposes. Foremost amongst these may be said are firstly, the promotion and facilitation of cooperative decision-making. Second, the coordination and alignment of priorities, budgets, policies, and activities across interrelated functions and sectors, ensuring a smooth flow of information within government and between government and communities with a view to enhancing the implementation of policy and programs. And finally, the prevention and resolution of conflicts and disputes. Now, it would be useful to have a look now at the dimensions of IGR. There are several different dimensions to IGR that provide the basis for analysis of intergovernmental relations, institutions, and processes. Now, at the risk of being a little bit technical, I think it's useful to consider these. These include vertical, horizontal, and sectoral dimensions, as well as the degree of formality with which IGR is carried out. Now, please understand again there that, that I'm not talking specifically of South Africa, but rather I'm talking from a global perspective. Let's look first at the vertical dimension. IGR occurs most importantly in the vertical relationship between the central government and subnational governments within any given country. The number and nature of subnational governments uh, vary from country to country. Some countries have two levels, many have three, some like Vietnam have four, and some like China even have five. And the powers, importance, relationships, and permanence of these levels depends to a large extent on whether the country is characterized as federal or unitary. Now, I won't get into an argument right now about whether South Africa is more federal or more unitary in character, but it's important to keep in mind that the essence of federalism is that the existence and powers of subnational governments are constitutionally guaranteed as we have in South Africa. Then we have the horizontal dimension. Horizontal IGR can take many forms. It may refer to relations between institutions within a government located in a particular sphere. For example, it might refer to relations between departments in the national government. And here one might find mechanisms such as the cluster system with which we in South Africa are familiar. You may also recall years ago when Tony Blair was Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, the big talk was about joined up government. These are all instances of the horizontal dimension of government. But the term may also be used to describe relation between governments uh, within a particular level. For example, relations between provinces in the provincial sphere of government. It might also arise when constituent units form alliances to take joint action not requiring the national government in order to discuss common issues or, on the other hand, to lobby the national government on issues of joint importance. And then we have the sectoral dimension. Now, this relates to the policy sector in question, so mechanisms may be created to facilitate relations between institutions established in different spheres or levels of government to perform functions in the same policy sector. So, for example, in a particular, any three-level country, for example, the central government may have a department dealing with health, the regional governments will each have their own health departments, and at local level, 
cities or towns may also have their own health departments or at least a health function. So a sectoral IGI mecha IGR mechanism may be established to coordinate health functions between the three levels. And then finally, we have the formal stroke informal dimension. Intergovernmental relations occur through both formal and informal means. Formal mechanisms can be constitutional, statutory, or by way of non-statutory institutions, agreements, and processes. Now, informal intergovernmental relations usually do not have a constitutional basis, but are often as important as formal mechanisms. So, for example, countries with older constitutions, for example, the United States of America, Canada, and Australia, generally have very little to say in their constitutions about intergovernmental relations, and their constitutions establish few, if any, institutions to deal with relations between their constituent units and the national government. Now, the rationale for this appears to be that it was simply assumed that the necessary instruments would be developed and that it was ne not necessary for the Constitution to make express provision for this. By contrast, countries with more recent constitutions and probably having learned from experience, such as Germany, South Africa, and Kenya, have tended to establish structures and mechanisms within their constitutions to cater for the inevitability of intergovernmental relations issues. So some countries have explicitly specified principles that should govern the conduct of IGR. So for example, in Kenya, the constitution speaks directly to cooperation between national and county governments. And South Africa's government, South Africa's constitution, as we all know, has section 41, listing the principles of cooperative government and intergovernmental relations. So this conveniently brings us uh, to the issue of cooperative or decentralized government and intergovernmental relations in the South African context, with particular reference to the constitutional and legislative framework which governs them. Now remember, up to now, we've been talking in general global terms. So now we'll look specifically at South Africa's model of decentralized government or cooperative government, call it what you will, and intergovernmental relations. Now, at this point, I have to say that both the chairperson and the minister covered quite nicely a lot of the aspects which I'm going to talk about, so forgive me if there's some repetition here, but um, let's go for it anyway. Now, you can have a discussion of the constitutional and legislative framework for IGR and cooperative government as long or as short as you like. It depends if you focus only on the specific constitutional provisions relating to cooperative government and IGR, or if you go further afield and include those aspects that are relevant but are not directly couched in IGR terms. So in this discussion, we'll be following to some extent the latter broader approach, but obviously given the time that's available, we cannot cover every aspect. The Constitution of South Africa provides the framework for the structures, mechanisms, and functions of government in South Africa. In Chapter 3, as we've already uh, discovered, it deals specifically with cooperative government and intergovernmental relations. Subsection 1 of Section 40 states that government is made up of the national, provincial, and local spheres, which are distinctive, interdependent, and interrelated. The crucial element is the statement that government consists of these three spheres. The multi-tier element is the crucial pillar of our government. But moving on, I must say I don't know how many different interpretations I've seen of, quote, distinctive, interdependent, and interrelated, unquote, but most of them are pretty vague and are often contradictory. Even the Constitutional Court has struggled to give meaning to these words, but nonetheless, the finding of the court provide um, the judgments of the court provide reliable or the most reliable interpretation which is which is to be found um, once in one such case judge chaskelson said that the principle of cooperative government is established in section 40 where all spheres of government are described as being distinctive interdependent and interrelated this is consistent with the way powers have been allocated between different spheres of government. Distinctiveness lies in the provision made for elected governments 
at national, provincial and local levels. The interdependence and interrelatedness flow from the founding provisions that South Africa is one sovereign democratic state and a constitutional structure which makes provision for framework provisions to be set by the national sphere of government. So that is the basis for our architecture of government. Chapters 5, 6 and 7 of the Constitution then go into focus on the structures, institutions, roles and responsibilities of each of the spheres of government. They deal with the executive authority and the legislative competence of each sphere. They also deal with intergovernmental support and the conditions under which the national government can intervene in provincial government and the conditions under which the provincial government can intervene in local government. Now, the powers and functions of the various governments are dealt in a rather complicated fashion in sections 44, 104 and 156 respectively of the constitution. And these constitutions are to be read with schedules four and five, which as we've already learned, set out the specific powers and functions allocated to the various spheres. Financial aspects such as intergovernmental transfers and the powers of provincial and local governments to raise revenue are also dealt with in the constitution. And so we can see that the three types of decentralization that we referred to earlier, administrative, fiscal, and political, are all reflected in the Constitution of South Africa. As such, the system of govern government envisaged by the Constitution bears, on the face of it at least, all the hallmarks of a decentralized system, which we translate in South Africa into the concept of cooperative government. Now, the creation by the constitution of this decentralized governance system, which comprised the three distinct but interrelated spheres of government, also gave rise to the need for a systematic system of IGR to give effect to the principles of cooperative government. Section 41, subsection 1 of the Constitution of South Africa enumerates the principles governing cooperative government and intergovernmental relations among the various spheres of government in South Africa. Now, again, both the chairperson and the minister alluded to these provisions um, at the risk of being repetitive. I think it is worthwhile just to mention them again because they are important and they should be kept in mind. Firstly, the spheres of government must preserve the peace, national unity, and indivisibility of the Republic. Secondly, they must secure the well-being of the people of the Republic. Third, they should provide effective, transparent, accountable, and coherent government for the Republic as a whole. They must be loyal to the Constitution, the Republic, and its people. They must respect the constitutional status, institution, powers, and functions of government in the other spheres. And critically importantly, they must not assume any power or function except those conferred on them in terms of the Constitution. They must also ensure that they exercise their authority and perform their functions in a manner that does not encroach on the geographical, functional, and institutional integrity of government in another sphere. And finally, they must cooperate in mutual trust and good faith, by fostering friendly relations, assisting and supporting one another, informing one another of and consulting one another on matters of common interest, coordinating the actions and legislation with one another, adhering <clears throat> to agreed principles and avoiding legal proceedings against one another. I should just mention that subsection 3 of section 41 specifically provides that organs of state should make every effort to settle disputes and should engage in litigation only as a last resort. Just going back a little, subsection 2 of um, section 41 of the Constitution stipulates that an act of parliament must establish the structures and institutions to promote and facilitate intergovernmental relations. Accordingly, the Intergovernmental Relations Framework Act was enacted in 2005, and I think it's already been mentioned that the objects of the Act include the establishment of a framework for the national, provincial, and local governments to promote and facilitate intergovernmental relations, <clears throat> to provide for mechanisms and procedures that would facilitate settlement of intergovernmental disputes 
and to facilitate coordination in the implementation of policy and leg legislation in line with the principles of coherent government, effective provision of services, monitoring the implementation of policy and legislation, and the realization of national priorities. Chapter two of the Act establishes a range of formal intergovernmental structures. Now, time prevents me from going through these in any detail, but I'm sure that you have ready access to the Act. I should just mention by name the structures which is established. First of all, there's the President's Coordinating Council. Then you have the National Intergovernmental Forums, which are also known as MINMEX. You have Provincial Intergovernmental Forums, uh, moreover, the premiers of two or more provinces can establish interprovincial inter forums for the purpose of promoting and enhancing intergovernmental relations. Then we have the district intergovernmental forums. And this is a forum, as you know, to enhance intergovernmental relations between the district municipality and the local municipalities in the district. And finally, two or more municipalities can establish an intermunicipality forum to serve as a consultative framework. The Act also contains provisions for the settling of intergovernmental disputes as envisaged by Section 41 of the Constitution. Now, it's interesting to compare the structures established under this Act um, with the various dimensions of intergovernmental relations which we discussed earlier. In these structures which are provided for in the Act, we find examples of the vertical dimension, for example, in the form of the President's Council um, and in the provincial intergovernmental forums. We also find <clears throat> the examples of the sectoral dimension in the form of MINMEX. We find horizontal dimensions uh, represented in the form of interprovincial forums or intermunicipality forums. And then finally, the formal informal dimension is reflected in the fact that all types of relationships between the various spheres are covered by statute. We need to look very briefly at a couple of other constitutional provisions which are relevant here. An integral part of the intergovernmental system is the responsibility for support and oversight by senior governments over junior governments. Now, it's perhaps a paradox of decentralization that whilst senior governments divest themselves of responsibilities by handing those responsibilities over to junior governments, those same national governments now have to assume greater responsibilities in that they have to up their games when it comes to providing support to junior or subnational governments. Now, this is crucial to the success of decentralization processes or cooperative government and the failure of the part of national governments to provide such support is often the reason why decentralizations often fail. Section 100 of the Constitution, which has already been mentioned, provides that when a province cannot fulfill an executive obligation, the national executive may intervene. And a similar provision, as we've already learned, also exists for provincial intervention in municipalities in the form of Section 139 of the Constitution. And again, another important provision which has already been mentioned <clears throat> is Section 154, which imposes a general obligation on national and provincial governments to support and strengthen, <clears throat> excuse me, the capacity of municipalities to manage their own affairs, to exercise their powers and to perform their functions. Now, it's also worth mentioning that the Constitution makes provision for dealing with conflicts between national and provincial legislation in sections 146 to 150, and between local government bylaws and national provincial legislation in section 156. One last bit of legislation that I'd like to look at very quickly because time is running out. Um, finance is obviously crucial in any government. So let's spend a little bit of time on this aspect. And now we're concerned with the Intergovernmental Fiscal Relations Act. Now, this act establishes two important forums or structures, the Budget Council, which consists of the Minister of Finance and members of the Executive Council of Provinces uh, responsible fi for finance. And they consult on any um, low fiscal, budgetary, or financial matters affecting the provinces, as well as any legislation that has financial implications for provinces. And then you have the Local Government Budget Forum, which consists essentially of the same components as the Budget Council, 
uh, together with representatives of SALGA, and it provides a forum for discussing financial matters relating to the local government fiscal framework. The Act also provides a process for revenue sharing and the allocation of money in terms of Section 214 of the Constitution. This process involves the consideration of the Financial and Fiscal Commission submission on the division of the equitable share between the three spheres of government and the allocation of funding to individual, provincial and municipal governments. And this, as you know, in turn, leads to the annual division of revenue bill, which allocates funding by a vertical process of division of revenue between the three spheres of government, and then by a process of horizontal division of revenue allocations between the individual uh, governments within each sphere. Now, I'm running out of time, so I have to bring this to a conclusion. Um, there are obviously other legislative provisions, mm -hmm. such as the PFMA, the PFMA, and so on and so forth, but I can't deal with them now. Now, let me conclude by saying that, as I mentioned earlier, this address cannot hope to cover every aspect of legislation that relates to IGR, nor can it deal with all of the institutions that are relevant. For example, I have not even touched on the role of the National Council of Promises, but I believe that this will be dealt with thoroughly in a later address. Nor have I provided a critical analysis of the effectiveness of our IGR framework, or for that matter, of the success of our decentralized system of government or cooperative government, call it what you will. This will, I believe, also be dealt with very adequately in later addresses in this workshop. But I do hope that I've provided a useful basis for understanding these and other issues which will be addressed in the course of this workshop. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Siddle. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, We'll move on now to Dr. D. Muhale. Dr. Muhale. Uh, Chair, thank you very much. Good morning to you. Good morning to the Honorable Minister. Good morning to uh, Honorable Members of NCOP. Even though I do participate here in my personal capacity uh, as a researcher and scholar, I think it is it is only fair that I recognize the presence of my of the chairperson of Municipal Demarcation Board, for I happen to serve with him in that board. Uh, I must indicate, Chair, that uh, rather as a function of coincidence, uh, I predicted that uh, Dr. Siddle may cover uh, a number of global issues. Uh, in, and in order to avoid the risk of repetition, I chose to focus my presentation within the overarching framework or topic that we have been given on what I consider to be the possible contribution of improving the functionality of cooperative governance and, and IGR uh, in relation to resuscitation of what I refer to as stillborn developmental state. And I will argue why I decided to try to establish the relationship between these two. Uh, all of us will recall that uh, at about 2003 or so, presidency released a discussion document uh, that I think for the first time in post-1994 marked the clearest indication that uh, we were moving uh, or were demonstrated some bias towards constructing a developmental state. And that has been the recurrent theme, in, at least in as far as the circles of the ruling party is concerned. You look at the 2007 strategy and take 6, 2012 up to so far. There is still ongoing commitment that we need to build a developmental state. Uh, further, I think the current administration uh, through from the inaugural address, annual state of the nation address, there is ongoing commitment from the president that uh, there are efforts to build a capable state. And I often prefer to start with setting the scene uh, so that there could be appreciation of why we do uh, what we are doing. Uh, and in my opinion, I think that today's session that brings together a number of brains and minds to bear on this important conversation is precisely to deal with the essence of government. Uh, we understand gov government to be a problematizing activity. And in our effort to resolve problems new and old that do exist, 
there is only one thing which we seek uh, to achieve, a failing which then there is no point why we should be having these conversations. Uh, at least as far as policy science is concerned, the view that I want to stress as part of setting the context for my submission is the fact that I'm hoping that at the end of the day, the decisions that will be taken out of this workshop and, and for consideration for implementation moving forward will not so much be about which ideologies or theories we cling uh, strongly on uh, to uh, the risk of being dogmatic, but I would want to stress that the purpose and the ultimate end of these conversations that we're having should be about the degree to which it actually helps citizens uh, meet their development aspirations and goals. Uh, and I'm raising this deliberately because I think there's an important injunction. Uh, the minister already made important references to, to the constitution. And I also decided to frame uh, my brief talk within the framework, I mean, within the context of some aspects of the preamble of the constitution, that the preamble commits us, amongst other things, to improve the quality of life of all citizens and free the potential of each person. And that comes from the preamble. And I do think that there is potential in as far as cooperative governance and IGR are, are concerned. Uh, again, taking into account the emphasis, I think for the first time that is enshrined in the National Development Plan where there's an emphasis on, on human capabilities. You may recall that an important point that uh, our founding president makes in his uh, autobiography the important concept or notion of indivisibility of freedom. Uh, and I'm raising this precisely because I think in the context of the uh, raging debate regarding uh, the extent to which uh, the constitution is facilitating the improvement of the quality of life of all citizens in order to free their potential, it is important that we understand that freedom does not only relate in as far as voting is concerned. Actually, the preamble of the constitution commits uh, by implication, if you like, to the indivisibility of freedom, hence the emphasis on freeing the potential uh, of each person. And I do think that if there is a role of, IG, of cooperative governance and IGR in pursuing this commitment that are embellished in the constitution and in pursuing at administrative level the, uh, the intention to construct a developmental state as a cause for development, as uh, Peter Evans would put it. Uh, as I said in my introductory remarks, I did, uh, I did uh, anticipate that uh, the, both the minister and the speaker before me would go at length in elaborating or enumerating the principles as, a, as contained in Section 42 of the Constitution. And I would not want uh, to get into that. Um, I also took it for granted that obviously members of parliament would be privy to what the constitution says in as far as principles are concerned. Uh, uh, I also must indicate that part of what uh, I'm talking about also draws importantly from three other sections of the constitution, uh, which is section 100, section 139, and section 154. And of course, I'm always the first to admit my bias despite uh, an expectation that will always bring scholarly presentation. But I spent 12 years of my body life in local government. And it, just, uh, it is inevitable that every now and then when one has an opportunity to share some ideas, they will always be biased towards, uh, towards that space. Uh, of course, the minister also referred to IGR Act of 2005 that institutionalizes the framework, the intention to depend cooperative governance. With this being said, I think the important question I need to draw with specific reference to sections 100 and 139, which deal with interventions in provinces and municipalities, is the important fact that such decisions constitute severe inroad in the institutional integrity of both provinces and municipalities respectively. And each and every time they are applied, or or they're invoked, that should be done with caution, appreciating the principle of equality and distinctiveness of each sphere of government. Of course, there can be a whole debate about whether in practice in, uh, this, uh, uh, these spheres are indeed distinctive and equal. Uh, 
Dr. Siddle already suggested that as he was about to conclude his presentation. Now, what cooperative governance and IGR uh, simply mean, in my humble opinion, is that there is an inevitable task that government must commit to, that there must be deliberate effort to invest in building coordination capacity as an attribute of a developmental state. And of course, if you look at the four attributes that are identified by both the ruling party and public service commission, the third attribute has to deal with the aspect of the macro organization of the state in as far as the collaboration between the three spheres of government are concerned. And I would further add that even at the level of provinces at the level of local government, it's two tiers. Uh, more often than not, we do not see a cooperation coming along uh, between adjoining municipalities despite the districts being there on assumption that they need to coordinate development at, at district level. It is still too early at this point in time to tell whether uh, the DDM is, is the appropriate intervention that will solve this perennial problem uh, in as far as uh, working together of adjoining municipalities and provinces is concerned. But it is also important to reflect on some challenges of cooperative governance and perhaps ask the question why they have become so stubborn. Uh, you would recall that as early as 1996, President Mandela appointed uh, Vincent Mapai to, uh, to investigate uh, how government was organized. If they are to win this, it's about strong evidence, strong. Oh, somebody said that. No, just just that to just make an appeal <laughs> that uh, uh, please do not uh, disturb the proceedings, um, and then allow let's allow Dr. Mahali to 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 finish his presentation. Please proceed. And uh, as I was saying, Chair, in 1996, you recall there was Mapai a commission, uh, which amongst others diagnosed serious weaknesses in as far as cooperative governance and, and IGR were concerned. Uh, within two years, in 1998, uh, the then Department of Local Government uh, uh, and Housing uh, published a review report. And importantly, some of the findings of that review report identified informal factors such as politics, uh, trust, leadership, and the quality of relations to be among the core or the root causes of the weaknesses in as far as the practice of corporate governance and IGR uh, is concerned. And I do think that while one has noted important points that the minister suggested they'll be looking into as part of the review of the 21 years of, of local government, it is also important that beyond what legislation will provide as interventions, which formalizes how the practice needs to be regulated and managed. There are all these other informal factors, which in many uh, instances are not, tend to be more influential than what would be prescribed uh, by legislation and policies. Uh, 2009, uh, there was a nationwide assessment of the state of local government. Uh, shortly after the department was, I mean, the name of the department was changed from DP, DPLG to COCTA. Again, cooperative governance and IGR, uh, the weaknesses thereof were identified as being among the reasons behind what the report at the time had, had, had or titled the distress in municipalities. And I do think that perhaps uh, if one may digress a bit, part of the important discussion which I hold we may not have uh, sufficiently as a country at the level within government and outside government is that when uh, COCTA was established in 2009, uh, there was an intention uh, to position it as the cog within entire government that would coordinate the practice of cooperative governance. Uh, of course, some some scholars uh, have been suggesting tentatively that perhaps uh, if, if we were to construct a democratic developmental state, we may need uh, the so-called super ministry uh, akin to the practices in East Asia. Uh, it could not be that there was an intention to position COCTA as such, but I do think that part of the, of the, of, of the review conversation 
must include questions as to whether we believe that uh, Okokta uh, does indeed serve as the cock as, as, as was envisaged then. I listened to the, some of the objective witnesses that the minister has raised in as far as uh, organizational structure is concerned and what the intent to do. 2011, uh, presidency or the National Planning Commission released uh, what they call diagnostic report. Again, IGR uh, witnesses were identified as a source for concern, and there was a commitment to quote uh, that moving forward to the country needs to move intergovernmental relations onto a more constructive uh, plane. In 2015, there was a discussion document that focused on planning that presidency released, and there's a serious uh, continuing document that the document uh, makes, and to quote, it said there is disconnection between the national planning function from key developmental priorities of provinces and municipalities. You would say, Chair, that I've deliberately decided to actually throw out or pull out what government is already aware of. Uh, scholars such as Dr. Sidley and other colleagues that will be presenting later today and tomorrow have done a number of work, I mean, a lot of work in as far as IGR and corporate governance is concerned. And I decided that let me just remind uh, the Honorable House that even within the circles of government, there is, there has always been acknowledgement that there's, a, there's an issue with cooperative governance and IGR and there's a need why it needs to, uh, to be resolved if we harbor any hope of restoring the idea of building a capable state or stroke, a capable and developmental state to quote direct uh, the national development plan. And I would like to briefly uh, cite some of the uh, examples, lift examples that I think are indicative of how we still struggle to, to get the handle uh, on the practice of cooperative governance and IGR. Uh, firstly, we've got to section 139. Uh, when the, when recently the government of Houghton placed Tswane under, under administration, uh, I suggested to some, some colleagues there that uh, I do not think that there was compliance with procedure. And one of the reasons I, I raised that was because, as the minister said, some of the steps include consultation with the minister and consultation with the NCOP. Uh, even before that process could be done. I must indicate that around 2012-2013, I actually conducted a detailed study on two interventions, and which interestingly, I think I don't think at the time there was uh, an act that, 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 that regulated uh, the implementation of Section 139, but there were guidelines that had been approved by the then DPLG. I think there was a bill uh, at that point in time. And even at that time, one could found out that in as far as steps are concerned in regarding consultations that must happen, consultation with the Minister of SOP and, and organized local government, those were not done. Uh, of course, there is dynamics why, why that would not even be done, and I'll speak to, to, to that shortly. But uh, if we accept, for instance, the injunctions of what the Constitution says and what legislation says, including consideration for placement of any municipality under, one sec under Section 139. And we accept that there is no sphere of government that can wholly succeed alone or fail alone. Uh, that indicates that at the moment there's consideration for such intervention, it copes weaknesses in as far as the functionality of the system uh, is concerned. Uh, the second point, which all of us are aware of, it has been well researched, is the effectiveness of IDP as planning instruments that in many, in many instances, they end up just being a, a wish list because when mayors convene a IDP forum or forums, we do know now that repeatedly, uh, sector departments from, from national and provincial spheres of government uh, often tend to send very junior officials who would not even be empowered to take any decision as far as commitments are concerned. And that is why part of the conversations that uh, this House had last year, May, the DG of Treasury said that there is continuing war in practice 
of, my, of councils approving unfunded budgets. The fact that the council would sit and approve unfunded budget again is a demonstration of the fact that our system of cooperative governance and IGR is not as cohesive and effective as it should be. Uh, and of course, the minister has, has already referred to uh, the pr uh, problems of possible tension between what COCTA should be doing and what Office of the Premier should be doing. Uh, sometimes Treasury also comes in and do a whole lot of other things. And it is important that even at that level of the province, in as far as co coordination is concerned, there has to be communication at horizontal level to ensure that inter support and oversight that are given to municipalities are well coordinated from the single window. And again, I did indicate that there was that thinking in 2009 that COGTA would serve as a single window of coordination. And I do think that part of this conversation must actually look if that idea was given enough uh, opportunity to thrive, and if it was, what could be done. Another point which has been uh, which has been problematic over the years, and I do think that Nico later today or tomorrow may speak to, to this. I'm not sure what he will be speaking on, but he had actually written a very good paper in the past few years about what he calls strangulation of local government, in which there is just ongoing policy overload that local government has to grapple with. And that on its own, uh, to an extent, uh, does affect the effectiveness at that, at that sphere of government. Uh, as recently as about two, three years ago, uh, you may recall that actually there were some regulations which, were, which came from Treasury, National Treasury, which were prescribing what local government or municipalities must do and cannot do as far as budgeting is concerned. Over and above the fact that already they are challenging uh, regulations such as uh, imposing the limit on what municipalities can offer as salary packages to municipal managers. And my argument has always been that if you, for instance, take one municipality called Tukoloho, just outside Infantain in the Free State, and you want to attract skill but to also impose uh, what the councils can offer as, as packages. And, you'd, and alongside that, you do not offer incentive, competitive incentive regimes. You are effectively denying uh, such smaller rural municipalities of any re uh, realistic success of attracting the kind of skills you are looking for. Because nobody, unless they are disparate, would go to an environment where they know that they may be paid less and then they are this, whole, this absence of social amenities that one would get if they were to be in Bloemfontein or any other secondary city or the cities themselves. Uh, and lastly, and, and I, I'm fully aware that this may not even be taken, I mean, this may be a, a point of controversy, uh, is that I, one is also of the view that one, one of the possible causes of the failure of the system is what one would refer to as generalization of local government. Uh, and of course, this, uh, if you like, it may be inevitable in the context of uh, uh, what Dr. Settle had already spoken to regarding the devolution of certain powers, including the responsibility of the national government in as far as uh, fiscal is concerned. But over and above that, that is often related to the hierarchy of, 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 of political parties that it would be very difficult for a city mayor, for instance, who may just be a, a chair of the region somewhere, to have an authoritative uh, disagreement or rejection of what the city MEC or premier may suggest, because internally at the level of the political party, uh, that mayor would be junior to, to, to such. And I do think that when in 2008, uh, the then DPLG said that there are informal sec factors as well that affect the extent to which IGR and cooperative governance could be effective, it's such things that also have to be acknowledged. And, the, and the, there has to be a way in which we could, all of us, think creatively on how we can minimize the impact of such informal factors because they, unfortunately, they cannot be avoided at all. Now, with having painted uh, the weaknesses, I mean, I mean, having painted th these examples of what, what then becomes the effects of the failure of cooperative governance and IGR, uh, 
when I started, I, I referred to what the Constitution commits us to as a people of the, of the Republic. And the Constitution unapologetically states that we need to heal the divisions of the past and establish a society based on democratic values, social justice, and fundamental human rights. That is very, very important. And it is within that con this context that I'm saying, if we were to achieve the state in which the entirety of local or, or the entirety of government through its three spheres of government can work uh, cohesively, I am sure that uh, at least the, the, the ongoing debate of social justice and, and commitment to fundamental human rights, we could be in a position to gauge whether we think that there is a substantive progress that has been made or not. Again, because of uh, the weaknesses in the system, we see the continuation of skewed planning uh, and development. The minister already mentioned uh, wastage of resources because we are, we are unable many times than not to leverage on the economies of scale because our planning, our planning does not uh, talk to each other. Uh, I'm aware that uh, Dr. Manuel is scheduled to present later on. I'm not sure what his focus would be, but uh, I've always held a view uh, that unless we get the system of cooperative governance to function, even an important commitment to transform the spatial landscape of this country uh, will, will remain a very good stream. Uh, the only solution is to ensure that uh, planning is coordinated. Once we achieve that, it will, I think that would be very easy to improve on that aspect as well. Uh, the long-term effect of the state being, being unable to meet its promises and commitments to the citizenry is that on the one hand, it deepens the trust deficit between the people and the state, uh, and that runs the risk of delegitimizing the very existence of the state, because the legitimacy of the state does not only have to do with the processes that get uh, public leaders into, into power. It has also got to do with the responsiveness of the state uh, in as far as commitment to improve the, the dignity of, of life of all citizens is concerned. Uh, Already we are aware now of the worrying continuation of economic exclusion. And we do know that from the experience of other countries that once you have got the large majority of citizens excluded from economic participation, you definitely run the risk of social instability. And if these things continue perpetually without any uh, genuine effort to scale them down, we are afraid that the long-term effect will be a possibility of a failed state. I don't think we are there as yet, but we do know that there are other people who are already thinking that South Africa is headed that way. So, to conclude, what can we do to salvage the situation? It is safe to acknowledge, firstly, that uh, a coordination, I, I do think that we, we do need coordination, we need to improve on that, but it is important that as much as we commit to three spheres of working uh, together, it, that is not an easy task. It takes a whole lot of technical processes and systems to be put in place, but on one hand, on the other hand, it also takes genuine commitment uh, of, the, of the role players concerned. And these are some of the in, intangible things that would be difficult to measure because it has got to do with the innermost conviction of, 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 of stakeholders at an individual level, at an organizational level, the extent to which we could be able to define what we, to define our common goal or to define our common interest and say on the basis of this common interest, this is what we will be doing moving forward. And I do not think that there can be any other uh, solution except uh, to continue to look for active solutions that will help the three spheres of government to improve on how we coordinate and integrate our planning. And if that could be achieved, uh, I do think that we'll get cooperative governance, the practice of cooperative governance and IGR where it is desired by the constitution. And if that will be achieved, I want to conclude, I do think that eventually the aspirations that we had of South Africa becoming a capable developmental state can be achieved through the system of, of cooperative governance and IGR. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Muhale. Uh, 
again, input uh, noted and appreciated. We will have to move on to uh, the last uh, presentation before lunch, and that is policy application of cooperative governance and intergovernmental relations, exploring the policy framework and legal jurisprudence in the meaning and application of cooperative governance and intergovernmental relations in South Africa. Uh, and insofar as this topic is concerned, we'll have um, uh, Ms. Avril Williamson, Director General, Department of Cooperative Governance, as well as Ms. Zelna Janssen, Attorney Community Activist and Chief Executive Officer of, of Zelna Janssen Consultancy. We'll start with uh, uh, Ms. Avril, Avril Williamson. Uh, program Director, uh, I want to also greet the Honorable Chairperson of the National Council of Provinces, the Deputy Chairperson of the NCOP, our Honorable Minister, Dr. Nkosazana Lamini Zuma, and to the Deputy Ministers that are also present, uh, also the Premiers, the President of Salga, and the Members of Parliament, members of the provincial executive, chairperson of the demarcation board, and I want to just also observe all protocols. So I firstly would like to commend the NCOP for convening the workshop, which provides a platform for all of us to actually appreciate the role and importance of cooperative governance and intergovernmental relations so that we are able to realize effective service delivery to our communities. So following our transition into democracy, uh, government had to set out or was set out uh, to do a difficult task. And this task of ensuring that this distribution of basic resources, you know, that all citizens depend on like water, electricity, sanitation, infrastructure, land and housing. And the foundation of this work is actually premised on redressing the injustices that we have experienced uh, in our past prior to democracy, and therefore the provision of basic services actually excluded the majority of South Africans. So with this enormous task at hand, uh, we adopted the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa in 1996, which established that the three spheres of government cooperative need to be cooperative with one another in mutual trust and good faith and to promote effective intergovernmental relations. So the principles of cooperative government and intergovernmental relations um, recognizes the interdependence of the three spheres of government in South Africa, and that is the national, the provincial, and local spheres, uh, which are distinctive, interrelated, and place a duty on the spheres of government to actually respect each other's powers, functions, and institutions, and to inform each other of new policies. And this has already also been touched on by both our doctors, uh, Siddle and uh, Dr. Mohali. So the Intergovernmental Relations Framework Act also sought to formalize our cooperation in the three-sphere system of government and in so doing to implement Section 41 of the Constitution. So Section 4 of the Intergovernmental Relations Framework states the objective of the Act is to provide a framework for the national government, provincial governments and local governments, and all organs of state within those governments to facilitate the coordination in, and the implementation of policy and legislation which includes a coherent government, and that also includes effective provisioning of services, monitoring and implementation of policy and legislation, and also the realization of all our national priorities. So although the Intergovernmental Relations Framework Act makes provision you know, for the specific implementation protocols in concluding the intergovernmental relations, as well as the internal 
procedures of intergovernmental structures, the relationship between these structures and institutions is not um, always as clear as we would like it to be in practice. So as we explore the policy framework and legal jurisprudence in application of the cooperative governance and intergovernmental relations, kindly allow me to reflect on the various court rulings where the constitution was used in judgments against the three spheres of government. It is important to note that from the onset, there are two very important departmental projects, namely the State of Local Government Support Project and the 21-year review of local government currently underway, seek to critically review the current system of cooperative government, governance and intergovernmental relations and its complexities. So it's fair to suggest that the IGR is one of the most contested areas in the configuration of the three spheres, as it is also directly, as it directly also questions the content, it, where it relates to the elements of powers and functions, and when accountability is sought for any dysfunctionality that may arise um, in the local government space. So, the district development model, uh, which I will also discuss a little further later, is the vehicle that we believe can help us to drive the content and the understanding for all the sectors and, and spheres. So honorable members, I would like to also take this opportunity to outline the conceptual difference between cooperative government and intergovernmental relations which is evident in the reference made to the principles of the cooperative government and intergovernmental relations in Chapter 3 of the Constitution. So cooperative government is a fundamental philosophy of government because it governs all aspects and activities of government and includes the deconcentration of power to other spheres of government and encompasses the structures of government as well as the organization and exercising of political power. So the intergovernmental relations is specifically concerned with the institutional, the political, and financial arrangements for, interac for interaction between the spheres of government and the organs of state as stipulated in the Constitution. So the intergovernmental relations is one of the institutional, sorry, is one of the means through which the values of the cooperative government may be driven or given, and it gives rise to institutional expression and may include executive or legislative functions of government. So the cooperative government represents the basic values of the government as stipulated in chapter three, section 41.2. And I won't necessarily also go into those details because they, uh, it has been discussed or addressed by the earlier uh, presenters. Safe to say that the cooperative governance is a partnership for us between the spheres of government, where each sphere is distinctive and has a specific role to fulfill and should promote constructive relations between them. So cooperative governance doesn't ignore the differences of the approach and viewpoint between the different spheres, but rather encourages that healthy debate to address the needs of the people they represent by making use of the resources that are available. So this is probably one of the reasons why in the premier of Western Cape versus the president of the Republic of South Africa in 1999, the constitutional court stated um, in paragraphs 54 and five that the provisions of chapter three are designed to ensure that in fields of common endeavor, the different spheres of government cooperate with each other to secure the implementation of legislation in which they all have a common interest. So although the principles of cooperative governance and intergovernmental relations recognizes the distinctiveness, the interdependence and the interrelatedness of the three spheres, this was interpreted by the Constitutional Court in the Independent Electoral Commission versus Langeberg Municipality in 2001, where in paragraph 26 of its judgment, 
to mean that these spheres are interdependent and interrelated in the sense that the functional areas allocated to each sphere cannot be seen in isolation of each other. Instead, they are interrelated. This means that none of these spheres of government nor any of the governments within each sphere have any inter interdependence from each other. However, it's also interesting to note that the High Court, in its judgment in Metropolitan Council versus the Minister for, for Provincial Affairs and Constitutional Development and others in 99, in paragraph 29, it stated that the apparent autonomy and ind independence of the local government sphere is relative and limited by unequal by uh, unequivocally expressed constitutional restraints. So the court also stated that the status of local government is, to a large extent, that of a junior partner in the tri trilogy of the spheres which make up the government of the country. So honorable members, a relationship of interdependence and interaction between government institutions as well as civil society, without a doubt, is necessary. And we know that Section 41.2 of the Constitution stipulates that an act of parliament must be established to provide for processes, structures, and institutions to promote and facilitate the intergovernmental relations and to provide for appropriate mechanisms and procedures to facilitate settlement of intergovernmental disputes. So this is also evident as we witness critical act of citizenship through an increase in civil society and individual citizen challenging government in South African courts. This is also coupled with highly contested local government political and administrative space as we also enter you know, into coalition politics. Uh, and this will further necess necessitate robust frameworks and acts that will hold ground when legally also challenged in court. So Section 421H, um, Five of the Constitution also provides that all spheres of government and all organs of state within each sphere must cooperate with one another in mutual trust and good faith by avoiding legal proceedings against one another. Therefore, it was in recognition of this provision that the Constitutional Court in the Utugela District Municipality versus the President of South Africa in 2003 ruled in paragraph 22 that the organs of states are obliged to avoid litigation against one another, irrespective of whether special structures exist or not. This means that all extra judicial avenues for resolving a dispute must be exhausted first before the affected parties may resort to court litigation. The jurisdictional diversity of intergovernment intergovernmental relations is revealed by a number and types of governmental institutions. So for example, institutions and government departments on national and provincial level, while the concept of intergovernmental relations has, has to be formulated largely in terms of human relations and human behavior, intergovernmental relations includes the officials, continuous day-to-day -day patterns of contact and in uh, exchanges of information and views where policy is generated by interactions amongst all public officials in the different spheres of government. Dr. Siddle also earlier spoke to some examples of cooperation in South Africa and he grouped them as well into the legislative cooperation, which then um, refers to the National Council of Provinces ensuring that provincial needs and interests are represented in the national legislative processes. So the three are the judicial cooperation, uh, it's also the administrative cooperation, and therefore the legislative cooperation. In the judicial cooperation, it refers to the institutions and functions of the judicial authority meet to interpret the constitution such as meetings of the judges of the High Court and the Supreme Court of Appeal, as well as meeting of judges of the Constitutional Court. From an administrative cooperation perspective, uh, it's where cooperation of public officials serving in the national and provincial sphere of government 
uh, where officials rendering the same services on national and provincial uh, departments could exchange information concerning any mutual interest. So there are some current IGR experiences, uh, and COCTA, through its research, has also shown that the environment in which our IGR our structures function is fairly broad, and that the national NDP, or the national, um, or should I say the NDP, further reflects that one of the problems in the current intergovernmental system is that intergovernmental relations structures are not strategic in that they are not fulfilling their intended objective of acting as a platform for coordination across the spheres. And the IGR is a political system and is a fluid process of interactions between spheres and the role players therein. So the effectiveness of the IGR system may really only be assessed by the extent to which it translates developmental policy into intent into actual service delivery outcomes through cooperative government in policy and planning, budgeting, implementation, and monitoring and evaluation processes across and within the three spheres of government. So with respect to resolving identified problems, the NDP advocates improving coordination between spheres rather than resorting to creating new intergovernmental structures and in terms of improving coordination between the spheres, the NDP proposes a two-pronged approach that distinguishes between routine and strategic coordination. Um, the NDP also suggests that the coordination problems be broken down into specific issues, which can be dealt with through the horizontal coordination, which would make it easier to build uh, constructive working relationships at the level where they are needed, so routine coordination is particularly relevant where problems relate to the implementation uh, and uh, policy formulation. So this requires that responsibility is delegated to officials at all appropriate levels, together with the necessary guidance and moving away from a hierarchical system where it is expected that all coordination agreements will be formalized at the highest level. So for this coordination, problems that arise because of disagreements between departments of gaps that no department is dealing with, that high-level coordination needs to take place on the strategic issues. Currently, um, there is no national legislation regulating interventions in provinces in terms of Section 100. In the case of municipalities, Chapter 13 of the Local Government Municipal Financial Management Act regulate Section 139 interventions in municipalities, but only where the cause of the intervention is of a financial nature. So there's no legislation to regulate interventions in municipalities arising from other causes. So the, the MC, or the Intergovernmental Monitoring System and Interventions Bill, is therefore intended to fill this void and to regulate interventions in terms of both Sections 100 and 139, However, in order not to encroach on the area already covered by the Municipal Financial Management Act, the bill will apply to discretionary financial interventions and Section 139, 4, and 5 interventions only to the extent that the bill's provisions are not inconsistent with the Municipal Financial Management Act. So the purpose of the bill is to provide for the supervision of provinces and municipalities and the supervision not only uh, intervening in a province or municipality when, when executive obligations are not fulfilled, but also uh, their monitoring to identify provinces and municipalities that are experiencing difficulties uh, in fulfilling of their uh, executive obligations. And where necessary, the pro provision of targeted national or provincial support in order to avert uh, defaults in service delivery. So targeted support is additional to the normal support given to provinces um, and municipalities to enable them to manage their affairs and exercise their powers and functions. So in moving towards an improved intergovernmental relations and cooperative government, the district development model is a necessary all of government and all of society reform and a practical intergovernmental relations mechanism for all spheres of government to work jointly and to plan and act in unison 
and to solve silos, duplication, and fragmentation. The model consists of a process by which joint and collaborative planning is undertaken at district metropolitan level together by all three spheres of government, resulting in a single strategically focused joint up, uh, plan for each of the 44 districts and the eight, eight metropolitan um, spaces in the country. So there's widespread acknowledgement that achieving integrated development through um, our system of the three spheres of government and a two-tier local system is institutionally uh, complex. Uh, this does pose challenges in terms of the intergovernmental relations uh, and cooperation framework, uh, but we believe that uh, the DDM will be there uh, to assist us in realizing the ideals uh, that we, we specifically need to achieve in each of the spheres and throughout the sectors or through each entity as each have their distinct constitutional powers and functions. So it is for this reason that empowering uh, provisions in the Intergovernmental Relations Framework Act is sought to provide a legal framework for the implementation and the institutionalization of the DDM. And what's one such empowering provision is Section 41, 47.1b of the uh, IGR uh, Act. And this prescribes that the minister responsible for COCTA uh, may promulgate regulations that will frame the coordination and alignment of the development priorities and objectives across the three spheres of government. So the gazetting of the regulations is something that we want to work towards uh, during this uh, financial year, uh, because we believe that it will enable COCTA to strengthen its coordination of the joined up uh, one one plans both vertically and horizontally and across the three spheres of government through the identified DDM IGR platforms and structures. So the model is firmly based on the analysis of previous and current initiatives to improve the developmental local government and IGR, wherein the developmental change is shaped and owned uh, at local level in partnership with communities, citizens, and social actors. The successful functioning of local government uh, for us is critical uh, in this regard. Uh, we also um, of the view that it's insufficient for us to, to own it without more cohesive, without a more cohesive governance and overall government coordination and functioning. Um, the model is aimed at enhancing powers and functions of our institutions which includes the ability to work in a cooperative way so that there is a greater cohesion and positive um, impact. And the DDM also seeks to address the capacity and capability challenges in local government to execute uh, their core service delivery mandate in some instances to also reverse uh, the state of the dysfunctionality that we also see. So previous and current capability uh, building and alignment initiatives have advanced the development of local government as an institution, although there has been uh, differentiated circumstances and a result across different municipalities. And of course, these have been influenced by levels of the economic base and various other viability factors. However, these initiatives were and are not able to address the root cause of some of the problems um, where we see a lack of alignment in a comprehensive way. So the DDM therefore aims uh, to address the service delivery challenges in local government. Uh, and um, this also supports the need to improve capacity and empower legal components in all three spheres uh, so that we are able to undertake this responsibility uh, jointly. And we look forward to working with all the stakeholders, including members of this house, as we give practical expression to the integration, the cooperation, coordination, and effective service delivery, which places the people at the center of government. Uh, so, so um, honorable chairperson, I wish to then thank the house for allowing us this opportunity to engage the workshop. And we look forward um, to hearing the various views and to also learn through the process and to also um, 
to also receive much more um, or participate much more in the engagements. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, 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 Ms. Avril. Uh, we will, uh, I guess, later on do what, 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 what we are saying, uh, that we need, we need to look um, uh, forward to a much more uh, uh, robust engagement uh, and, and possibly um, uh, explore possible solutions to some of the, of the issues that we have raised. Now, thank you very much. Uh, we'll then move on to Ms. Zena Janssen. Ms. Janssen, are you there? Um, I'm here, Chairperson. Okay. Please, please. Good afternoon, Chairperson. I would just like to remind you that I swapped um, sessions with, I think, Professor uh, Tipscott. So I'll be talking about the, um, on the issue of effective local government planning and intergovernmental relations in South Africa, picking the pitfalls and devising a future role for parliament. So I'll be um, making suggestions around that. I did prepare a presentation, so I'm just wondering, is it possible to screen it or should I just talk from it? Yeah, please talk to it. Uh... Uh, and, and we'll, we'll ensure that it is uh, distributed. Okay. Thank you, Chairperson. So um, I think just to, before I, ex uh, uh, I think it's important to, to tell you who I am and what I do in order to give you context as to why I'm making these suggestions I will make later. So I am the Executive Director of uh, Zalm Jason Consultancy and it's a social enterprise aimed at bringing people together to find solutions and to have more effective, uh, better conversations with law and policymakers. And this is achieved through assisting community organizations, uh, businesses, and other stakeholders um, convey their messages so that they can have an opportunity to raise their voice and therefore influence uh, laws and policies affecting them. So. Sorry, I am an admitted attorney. I have a bachelor's of arts degree, pre-law, a bachelor's of law, um, a master's of commerce degree, uh, specializing in international trade law and policy. And I worked for and consulted for parliament, uh, the Department of Justice, the Law Society of South Africa, the tobacco sector, um, Catholic Church, Uber SA and uh, KwaZulu Natal um, legislature, uh, political office bearers, gender based violence advocacy groups, and community organizations. So I've done this um, quite a bit of work around uh, public participation. And on the social side uh, of what I've done is to empower citizens and community organizations to become more actively involved in the communities. And this has been done through educational workshops with community organizations about how. Uh, government works, how to participate, and how to hold political office bearers accountable. And quite a bit of work I've also done around um, advocacy on gender-based violence. Um, I've also assisted community organizations with technical and drafting assistance on submissions to, uh, uh, par uh, to uh, on bills before parliament, uh, government, and provincial legislatures, and as well as drafting um, toolkits on domestic violence um, to assist uh, community organizations. Um, and I've also facilitated meetings between community organizations and um, government. I also have uh, quite a number of tutorials on governance issues and how to influence um, on my YouTube channel, which I share on um, Facebook as well. And then I do as I also do quite a bit of opinion editorials about raising awareness and how you can um, influence um, law and policy. A few years ago, I started a school project aimed at educating learners how to raise their voice and influence um, policy and law. And this was quite significant because um, these learners sent letters to politicians uh, explaining 
what the concerns were, and there were actually tangible outcomes for them. So I've been doing this for about five years, and I've shared, um, so I have quite a bit of insights on public participation, which I have shared with members in uh, the NCOP, as well as the National Assembly. Um, so I do lobbying as well. But just to move forward, um, I'm going to uh, Ila uses an example to illustrate um, why IGR is important. And so many of the speakers have already alluded to it. And it's a, I hope that um, people can um, obtain the presentation because there's a picture that I, I've used to, to illustrate. So an example that I want to use, and it's not factual, it's purely just to, to show what the pitfalls are and how this can impact effective planning in local government. So there are walkers um, that in Mitchell's Plain Town Centre and they've started growing their vegetables in a warehouse and they've discovered a method of growing vegetables in an affordable way. So this is just an example. And they approach the ward councillor at local government, of course, to for advice as to how they can expand their business beyond serving the communities in Mitchell's Plain and to the entire South Africa and possibly the rest of Africa. And this will obviously grow the economy and create employment. So for this to happen, there would need to uh, be discussions with a national provincial department of agriculture, trade and industry and small business development for them to obtain advice as to how to go forward, how they can the venture, if there's funding needed, um, what sort of skills do they need um, and other sort of advice that they would need. So what is important is that there would need to be these linkages that is already established. And I heard the DG mention that they have this model. So if that is established, then, then it would be um, a success. And we are aware already that, that trade and agriculture, they fall within the national and provincial competence in terms of schedules four and, and five of the constitution. However, section 152.1c provides that local government must promote social and economic development. And as the minister said earlier on, that um, section 154 says that provincial and national government must um, support uh, local government in achieving their objectives. So the informal trade workers will only succeed if the existing, if they, as I mentioned earlier, if there are existing linkages um, or established relations between the local government and the provincial government and local government and provincial and national departments. And the pitfall is, of course, if there are no linkages, then that proposal that they have would be lost. And whatever they desired for themselves and for the community would be lost as well. And at the same time, it would also impact, you know, the effective planning at local government level when they plan for the independent development plans, they would not know where to go to if they um, wanted to um, maybe resolve crime or any other social issues. So in terms of uh, what I've been asked to do, it brings, it brings us back to the question of how best can Parliament um, through the National Assembly and the National Council of Provinces take the lead in advancing cooperative uh, governance and intergovernmental relations. And I th think the best way that this can be done is to foster a culture of working together in government. So already the minister earlier on said that there needs to be this working together, um, but yet things are still happening in silos and there are many other reasons for tensions, political and, and other things. But Parliament has three mandates. So it has the oversight function, uh, public participation, as well as the legislative mandate. So I, I think in terms of the oversight mandate, it can develop a guiding paper on IGR for committees, portfolio committees or select committees. And obviously this can also be applicable to provinces as well. And committees could use the guiding paper to ask questions when conducting oversight visits uh, or when departments and governmental organizations brief committees to ask them what initiatives they have to take whatever programs they have and steer towards local government level. Um, and how often are they making sure um, that there's no working in silos? And I think that will start if it's something that is um, 
continuously thrown at departments when they come there, it will start chipping away at this, like, we have, it's my mandate and I have to do what I have to do. Um, so that's one of it. The other um, thing that Parliament, uh, through the NAMCOP, can consider is public participation. So we do have the Youth Parliament, uh, the Parliament on Women. Um, so I was thinking maybe there could be a specific parliament dedicated to IGR. It doesn't have to be a parliament. It could be a symposium. And, and clearly, there needs to be more discussion uh, around how better to develop IGR or networks or linkages so that they can reach the people at the bottom. Um, so at this conference, uh, local, provincial, and national legislatures um, and other stakeholders, because there would need to be business involved as well, um, can meet to talk about and raise awareness about the importance of IGR, but also to develop um, a best practice on how legislatures can assist in achieving this concept of working together or this culture of working together in government. So those are the suggestions that I want to make, Honorable Chairperson. Um, and I wish to thank you for the opportunity to be able to share my view. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, there we are. Uh, we will now uh, uh, open for, for discussion. Uh, and please feel free to raise your questions uh, and, and comments. Uh, even better, uh, uh, raise ideas. Not uh, uh, envisages uh, solutions. Uh, to 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 the challenges, so we're now opening up. Uh, please raise your hand if you wish to to make a comment, um, and then we'll take it from there. Uh, Detroit. Thank you, um, Honourable Chair. I'm in the room. <laughs> Honorable Chair, thank you for the opportunity. Yes, please proceed. Um, Minister Tlamini Zuma alluded that the spheres of government must not exercise their powers on other spheres of government and interfering in their way of conducting their business. But currently, the Minister allows, according to the prescripts through Section 100 and Section 139 interventions, for, uh, for, that, for those interventions to take place on a continuous basis without yielding the required results. And this is to a huge cost to legislatures and municipalities. And we, in the NC we as the NCOP even debated on this, Jay. Jay, it's evident that corruption and fruitless and wasteful expenditure is allowed to, to take place under these administrations' so-called watch and at the helm of provinces like the Northwest Province and local municipalities under Section 139. In the meantime, very little to no consequence management is implemented uh, to, to the executive of municipalities and the legislatures. And this district development model will not work. Further amalgamation will not work. We need to focus on locality and subsidiarity. We need to have more and smaller municipalities, Jay, with locally focused functioning. Minister Dlamini Zuma, the economy will only thrive when the state of disaster is lifted. Only then will businesses be able to conduct their business. Only then will the economy bloom again and will the state of municipalities be better off. When will the state of disaster be lifted, Minister Dlamini Zuma? Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, the next uh, person to speak is Brandama Tebula, who will be followed by Honorable Raida and then Honorable Dango. Let's start with Matebula. Thank you very much, Chair, and then thank you for the briefing. Um, I'll pose my question to, to the Minister. I would like to know how do, Minister, I would like to know how can you make sure that internal fights uh, especially for officials in municipality, does not disrupt service deliveries for our people. Um, I'm going to give a practical example for where I'm coming from in Guyan. 
there was a continuation of fight between a, a mayor and a municipal manager, which caused uh, our people not to get services. So I just wanted to check with the minister uh, if there is a consequence management that has been put in place to make sure to monitor this kind of situation and resolve it in time so that the service might go to the, our people. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable Ryder. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson, and uh, many thanks to the various presenters for the time and effort that has gone into the uh, preparations uh, for your various presentations today. I think that, uh, Chairperson, your opening remarks, I, I did try and listen quite carefully, though it was quite difficult, um, and, and you spoke about the reaffirming the role of the NCOP in advancing cooperative governance and intergovernmental relations. Now, I'm going to bounce around a little bit. I'm not necessarily going to go in order, but I think Dr. Mahali actually made some excellent points about the fact that IGR uh, at this stage carries a great degree of mistrust. Um, and as soon as uh, one sphere of government feels the influence or sees some kind of movement coming from a different sphere of government, there's an immediate uh, sense of mistrust that immediately starts to crop up. And of course, you know, this is quite understandable because if one looks at, uh, you know, I think probably the key central focus of the minister's uh, um, delivery today was around sections 139 and, and section 100 um, of the constitution where, you know, it's not necessarily IGR, it's certainly not cooperative governance, it's, it's wielding a stick. Um, now, since the minister opened that particular door, um, um, she, she, she did raise the point that, uh, you know, uh, there's a very, her words, her exact words were a very detailed section 139. But the problem, Minister, is that Section 139 is not very detailed. Uh, we've had discussions before. You've been present in those discussions uh, in this House where we're discussing Section 139. And the biggest problem that we've found is that in terms of Section 139.8 and, of course, Section 100.3 when it comes to provinces, there is no subordinate legislation that gives sufficient guidance on how sections 100 and 139 should actually be formally implemented. And Dr. Mahale was, was, was quite correct to say that, that you know, the, these things are often wielded as political weapons. In fact, Minister, I think you made the same point yourself, where you said that uh, sometimes when it, it, it comes to the wielding of section 139, um, it, it seems to be more intra-party, uh, sorry, inter-party, or even intra-party when it comes to factions uh, that, that are performing their fights. I mean, we've seen this several times. The the obvious one that Dr. Marley mentioned was uh, uh, Chuane. We've, we, we've also seen the Section 100 intervention into the Northwest Province um, and and and, and uh, the factors that have come out in that in that process so far. But I think the biggest point that I want to make on this on on this matter is the fact that these interventions are not actually achieving results. We've had the inputs from Selga, and Minister, you were with us when we had those inputs from Selga, where the comment was made that there has not been one successful Section 139 intervention that has taken place since the year 2000. So uh, it's a serious indictment. And Minister, I think my plea is certainly let's get Section 139.8 and Section 100. Point three, let's get that subordinate legislation finalized. It's a matter that's going to place the NCOP in a much more advantageous position where we understand our role in terms of IGR. We're sitting here, and I've done substantial research um, before today, and I've gone back to, to, some, uh, to a speech that President Mbeki made uh, on the 10th anniversary of the NCOP. Uh, where he referred back to a speech that he made on, I think, the third anniversary, the second or the third anniversary, we was talking about the role of the NCOP and, and, and intergovernmental relations and the role of oversight and so on. 
Now, there still remains a lack of clarity in terms of what our role is as the NCOP. And I'm hoping that we're going to have a little bit more insight. I've had a look at the program for the next two days as well. Uh, it looks like there's a little bit more coming, but I had hoped for a little bit more, more today, specifically highlighting what is our role. Because if one considers that you know, Section 55.2 gives specific details of the oversight role of the National Assembly, um, Section 55.2 of the Constitution gives the specific oversight role of the uh, National Assembly over the executive. Uh, section 1142 gives specific oversight role by provincial legislatures over their respective executives. But there's a big gap when one looks at the roles and responsibilities of the NCOP, where our paragraph in the Constitution is not as explicit in terms of our oversight role. And this really is something that we need to confront, discuss, and finalize. And if necessary, uh, you know, th th there must be some sort of amendment to legislation that gives us uh, detailed uh, information as to what our role is in terms of both oversight and IGR. Because at the moment, all we do is we wield the stick and invariably it's being wielded in terms of Section 139 and 100 for all of the wrong reasons and with little good effect. So, yes, I do think that um, Ms. Williamson's uh, proposals around the, uh, the district model being the solution to all of this uh, was undersold. Um, I don't think that, the, the, that anyone was convinced by, 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 by the comments there. Certainly those that have not been already convinced were not uh, further, were not convinced. Perhaps those that are already on board were further convinced, but no, the rest of us are still having some doubt about the district model and how this will work because essentially the constitution specifies and it's supported again by the municipal um uh, structures act specifies the different roles of uh, different types of municipalities so um you know uh we see schedule four we see schedule five um and roles and responsibilities and powers and functions um are reasonably well detailed there uh, again a one-size-fits-all approach across the entire country is certainly not appropriate specifically if one looks at the realities within a fairly small but highly populated province like Kaoteng and compares it to the uh, largely rural uh, provinces such as the Eastern Cape and perhaps the Northern Cape as well, uh, you know, there are differences and a one-size-fits-all approach is certainly not going to work. But uh, yes, Chair, please, let's talk more. Let's find out what is our role. I don't think that question has been adequately addressed today, um, but I do want to specifically get an answer from the Minister. When can we see that subordinate legislation in terms of 139, 8, and 103? Thank you, Chair. So thank you very much. Uh, we'll now move on to Honorable Dango. Uh, thank, you. thank you very much, Chairperson. Chairperson, I think all the inputs are there, there to actually establish a way forward to find common solutions to what we do in the NCOP, what local government does, and what the National Assembly does, um, and what we do at all three levels, all three spheres of the state. I think we need to look and examine the district model against the background of where we come from. We come from spatially separate uh, areas that have now been brought together in one city. And those cities, whenever you mean they are intended to become permanent residents, they were supposed to be for, for a certain time, then people had to move off to homelands. And this is where the crisis of the problem is. And that brings us to the question of how we actually report including the order of the general reports on the, on the differences between fruitless uh, and other kinds of expenditure. Now, when you're going to war, you don't budget for going to war. You go to war. And what we have here is informal settlements growing all the time. So we'll always have the kind of statements coming that this was irregular expenditure. So I think in the communication that we're using, we need to look at what is irregular expenditure and understand that we're going to have irregular expenditure continuously because people have been denied, people have been dispossessed, 
and people had been oppressed. And I think the attempt today by both the minister, yourself, and other speakers, as chairperson, is to actually take us forward to a joint solution, not fault finding. I thank you very much, chairperson. Yes. Now, thank you very much, Honorable Dango. And there we are, uh, issues of corruption, uh, uh, and a, an example of that being somewhere in Northwest, uh, the, the development model being present, pre presented as, as a part of the, the broader solution, uh, uh, that the state, the state of disaster need to be uh, uh, lifted, uh, and those questions were meant for the, for the, for the, for the minister. Uh, 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 then there's uh, 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 questions by a rider, uh, which include amongst others the question on, one, on, on section 139 uh, and, and, and emphasis on uh, the need to clarify the role of the NCOP a bit more, make it more explicit uh, as expected. And then Dango raised, raised a number of questions as well, uh, that we must be solution oriented uh, uh, as, as we engage and, and debate these matters, uh, uh, historical issues, uh, including that cities were not inclusive and, and the core problems around informal settlements and the regular expenditure and so on. Now, uh, can we have uh, the responses? Uh, uh, Minister, are you there? Yes, I am. Please, can you just make your a few comments? Yes. Um, for the first question, Honorable Chair, you'll recall that one of the things I said was there are a lot of our problems in the municipality tend to be uh, political. Uh, and there's inappropriate interface between the political, exec the executive, and the administration. And that's what, in some way, is being described here. But I also said, the political parties must also intervene because if the if the person that you send and to be in that space and they are acting inappropriately, the the political party must also intervene and intervene time must. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things, but of course. The, the province will also intervene. They are the first line of call if there is a problem between the mayor and the, and the MM. The national would be the very last because the, um, the first point of, of call, the oversight, the first point of oversight comes from the province to the municipality. So I think those are some of the things I was trying to explain that we, we need to work together, all of us, to manage those kind of things. Um, but where that becomes a hindrance to service delivery, um, you'd recall that in some instances, We've had to work with working with Treasury, depending on what the fight is about, because sometimes it's about how the resources are used, how the MFMA is used, or the fight is political because the mayor wants the MM to do certain things which he is not allowed legally to do, and he's refusing. So depending on what the fight is about, of course, uh, they, 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 they will be intervention, but mainly it starts with the province. The question about intervention 
If you recall, I emphasized a lot on section 154 because section 154 mandates the national and the province to support the municipalities so that they are able to do their work to fulfill their functions. But the problem is exactly where the honorable member, um, where the honorable member said that uh, each sphere, once it sees another sphere coming, it becomes suspicious and doesn't trust. Now, when you apply 154, it's not a stick. You're trying to help so that it doesn't come to the point where you have to apply 139. But indeed, it is correct that the, 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 the sphere becomes distrustful. Why are they coming here? Why do they want to help us? Do they want to take um, our powers? Do they want? And until we, we are able to, um, to build that trust, that we're not really coming to take over, we're not coming to, to be a policeman or woman, but we are there to assist so that we, we never end up in 139, but also so that our citizens do get the services in a sustainable manner that they should be getting. The same mistrust is with the DDM. Um, in some uh, municipalities and in some provinces, there is mistrust of the DDM because they think, oh, uh, the government is coming now to, to interfere or to take over or is an entry point into our area, into our space which we govern. Instead of looking at it as a cooperative way of working. So I think we, we should have open minds and look at the district development model not as a threat, but as a way of assisting citizens to get what they deserve the services, but also is to maximize the impact of the resources that we have. And also the communities, the communities end up asking, aren't you all from Pretoria? Last week there was this department, last month there was that department, now there's this department, next week there'll be this department. Instead of us working together and coming to the community together, and so the community doesn't have to spend all this time listening to different people at different times. And in the end, they end up not participating because they are tired of being called for, from the same government, but different people, different times. So I think we, we, we need to look at it like that. Now, coming to the subordinate legislation that the honorable member was talking about, I did explain that from our side, we have finished all the consultations, except that before we take it to cabinet, it must go to DPME for social economic impact certification. So that's where it is now. And also we've done it concurrently we also sent it to the state law advisor's office so that they can look at it in terms of constitutionality compliance. So that when we put it to cabinet and bring it to the to parliament, we, we, it will not be found to be unconstitutional or doesn't comply or also social economic impact. We need to have a positive or negative social economic impact. That's where we are. We're waiting for those certifications. Once the certifications are done, it will go to cabinet from there. Uh, it will then be able to come to parliament. 
So I, I thought that that's that's what I will I will be able to to say. But I, I think give the district development model a chance because it really tries to maximize the impact to use the resources in a more impactful manner. It also tries to bring the skills that may not exist in the local sphere. Yes, some members may talk because they come from rich municipalities that do not need assistance. They have all the engineers, they have all the planners, they have everything. But some municipalities don't. And through the DDM, we can assist them to, to get those skills and share them uh, within that district and share it amongst the, the municipalities in that district. Thank you. No, thank you very much, uh, Minister. Uh, uh, there's, been, there's been some issue that has been raised about the state of disaster, uh, when that is, is going to come to an end and so on. Uh, well, the minister is part of a collective, of a, of a team uh, of the national uh, 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 collective, uh, and, and that national collective, I'm sure, led by the president. Uh, 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 that, 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 that is coordinating these battles. Uh, we'll at an appropriate time make a pronouncement uh, on, on, on the state of disaster. But the point yes, is, uh, so, uh, I could say something on that. I could say something on uh, Are there any other comments? Uh, let me just say something, Chair, if you allow me, on the whether when the state of disaster will end. Please continue. <laughs> What, we, what we've done as, as COCTA and with agreement of cabinet, we've asked all the departments to give us inputs into why it shouldn't end or whether they are ready to end it. Because if you, if you look at the national state of disaster, it only comes in when government, when the departments, including the Department of Health, do not have sufficient powers using their legislation to be able to deal with the issues. So health has been looking at its own regulations to see, because we, all of us would be very happy when the national state of disaster ends. But it should end in a seamless manner where you will not have problems because you have ended it. So we've asked all departments to say whether at this point their legislation will be able to carry what needs to be done, including health, including everyone. But health in particular, their regulations need to be consulted. So those consultations will take a bit of time, a month or so, I don't know. So we are waiting for those inputs. They'll all give us those inputs today. And then we we'll look at it and we we'll make as government an informed decision whether the national state of disaster must end or not. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. Uh, uh, fellow delegates and uh, the participants, uh, we have now come to an end uh, of, of this session. Uh, uh, we'll now go for lunch and reconvene uh, uh, again. Uh, we'll be back again at, uh, 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 to, back to the meeting, back to the session. Um, at, at two o'clock, at fourteen hundred hours. Okay, so until fourteen hundred hours, uh, thank you very much uh, for now.
So the, the, the session is adjourned. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I'm Recording ready. stopped. Ends, JPC. I would just say thank you, Chair. Oh, okay. Recording in progress. Okay. Let's, let's Person, where, is again, let's where is where is lunch, Chepesi? <laughs> <laughs> how, how I wish you were you recording were stopped. Because I've, I've, I've uh, <laughs> some bread and so on. I'll share that with you. <laughs> it's here at the Houghton Legislature Chair. No, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you.
Nyambi, Chief Whip of the NSOP, Honorable Mohai, the Provisional Whips, the Programming Whip, Honorable Njandu, Chairperson of the Select Committee, Committee Whips, the Honorable Members of the NSOP, all presentative from all nine provinces present, present Salga, a Secretary of the NSOP, Advocate Pimbela, all invited guests and presenters from different institutions, all officials present, honored members, I will be presiding and chairing this session, which is section two of our visual workshop on cooperative government and intergovernmental relations. The role and effectiveness of local government planning and intergovernmental relation cannot be overemphasized. Its role is to offer policies through the effective flow of communication to coordinate priorities and budget across different sectors and the prevention of dispute and conflict between spheres of government. In this session, honorable members, we will be looking and unpacking the effective local government planning and intergovernmental relation in South Africa, picking the pitfalls and dev devising solution for the future role of parliament. Honorable members, to help us unpack the topic, we have invited two presenters. The first presenters will be Professor Chris Tapscott from the School of Government of the University of the Western Cape. On behalf of the NSOP leadership, we welcome your profession, we wel welcome you, Professor Tep Scott, to our workshop, and we we'll thank you for availing yourself. Honorable members, the second presenter will be Mr. T. M. Magnoni, Chairperson of the Municipality Dema Demarcation Board. Mr. Magnoni, you are most welcome to our workshop. And we also thank you for availing yourself for workshop. Narendra Mount, the Prime Minister of India, once said, I quote, my good governance is not enough. It has to be pro-people and proactive. Good governance is putting people at the center of development process. That is precisely what we want to see happening. After the two presentation, honorable members, it will be an opportunity for all participants to engage with the presentation, ask clarity seek question, and propose solution. Honorable members, participants will be encouraged to switch on their video when asking questions, unless there is a poor connectivity where they are located. Professor Tepko and Mr. Magnoni will thereafter respond to all the questions raised by the participants. Lastly, the chief whip of the NSOP, Honorable Mahai, will do the summary of issue for the day one. Make some announcement about the proceeding for day two of the workshop. And give some closing remarks, which will be end our proce uh, proceedings for day one of the workshop. In conclusion, I want to close this quote from Martin Luther King Jr. Our lives begin to end. The day will become silent about things that matter. Over to you, Professor. Thank you. 
Many thanks. Good afternoon uh, to the chairperson of the NCOP and to the Honourable Minister of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs, Honourable Members and to other eminent um, guests here. Um, I have prepared a PowerPoint, but as some of those uh, slides have already been dealt with in presentations this morning, I will just speak to the remainder of it, uh, but the PowerPoint itself can be, will be circulated. I just want to, to go over one or two points. Um, we heard this morning about the different dimensions of, of intergovernmental relations. Uh, it has political, administrative and economic dimensions. Um, but I wanted to stress that IGR is never, is, it is always a contentious process. Uh, There's always one because it involves those three dimensions, particularly the economic and political one. It is always a topic that is going to be contended by different parties, whether it be in the polity itself or within society. Um, even uh, constitutions or democracies that are hundreds of years old are still contesting different dimensions of their IGR. Um, so what we have, what we're confronting today in South Africa is nothing particularly new. Maybe the scale and the dimensions of it may be different, but it is always, cont uh, it is always contested. Um, in the apartheid era, strangely enough, there was little, very little contestation. Uh, that was because we had, they had what is called deconcentration of power rather than decentralization of power. Uh, the provinces were basically just branches of the central government and uh, reflective of that, the provincial administrators who were responsible for, for the overall oversight of provinces were actually members of the, of the national cabinet as well. The objective was to make sure that uh, apartheid was uniformly implemented. Local governments themselves had very, very little power, very little what they called originating power. They worked according to what are known as a set of ordinances and they weren't allowed to step outside of those. There were one or two cases where uh, there was contestation between the very few um, municipalities that were run by opposition parties uh, and the government, but in that case, the government simply removed responsibility from uh, what they felt was a, a contending and contentious uh, municipality. So we, we don't have a long history of IGR in this country to work on, albeit a bad one from the party, we just simply didn't have one. And as was pointed out this morning, the Presidential Review Commission in 1996 was one of the first um, entities to, once with first uh, commissions to point for the need for a review of our intergovernmental relations systems. Um, now, as we've heard this morning, and I, I don't want to draw too much on it, but there is some ambivalence in the constitutional framing of, of IGR in South Africa. Um, we heard that uh, from the founding provisions that South Africa Republic is one sovereign democratic state. And I think by all understandings, that is known, what is known as a unitary state. Uh, that we have heard the ambivalence now in, in the chapter three provisions which speak about distinctive, independent, and interrelated. And uh, that one sphere must not, encroach, must not encroach on the geographical, functional, institutional integrity of another government in another sphere. Um, so there is, this particular chapter is, I wouldn't say it's at odds, and we did hear this morning that maybe this is a philosophy rather than a system of intergovernmental relations. But um, it, it, it doesn't say an awful lot about how this is to be carried out. Um, chapter three focuses almost exclusively on the need for uh, coordination, respect, and harmony. Uh, and to that extent, it's, it's aspirational. And I think it reflects uh, the particular time when it was written, the need for national reconciliation, the need for bringing the country together. Uh, it makes no mention of how national policy might actually be implemented. And in, in some respects, this formulation could be seen um, Cooperation is almost seen as an end in itself, but rather than as a means to an end. And I do understand the political dynamic of it, but it has left us with some challenges uh, going forward. Uh, at the time, there was a talk of the need for legislation to, to, to add um, clarity to the provisions of Chapter 3 and, and other chapters, 6 and 7 others, of, of the Constitution. Uh, when the uh, Intergovernmental Relations Framework Act finally came out in 2005, nearly 10 years later, it too 
was primarily focused on setting up structures to facilitate coordination and resolve disputes. And uh, it said relatively little about implementation of national policy uh, might be assured at, at uh, provincial and national levels. Um, but the, I mean, the important point though is, is to add though that in, in sections 155 of the constitution six and seven, um, national and provincial government are charged with supporting local government. Um, they are supposed to provide monitoring and uh, support, uh, promote development of local government capacity. Um, national government and provincial government have these responsibilities. Uh, I think this is an important one. I'll pick this up a bit later in my presentation, just to say what are the responsibilities of uh, provincial and local government in the affairs um, of, of local government uh, generally. Um, the constitution does also make mention of, uh, of make provisions for interventions of higher levels of government in the affairs of lower levels when they're not performing. This applies to provincial government uh, as well as to, to, to local government. Um, but generally speaking, these interventions only occur uh, in fairly extreme situations. I know there have been increasing numbers of municipalities placed on administration, but generally these interventions take place uh, almost at a point of crisis. We have heard today that uh, sometimes this, these interventions are misused for political reasons, but generally speaking, from my own background research, the majority of them have come when a municipality has singularly failed in fulfilling its, its constitution ob um, obligations. Um, uh, but I'll, I'll speak a bit more about that. The, the, the objectives of, of local government now are very, very different from those of, of, of the previous uh, era. As we know, it's supposed to be the foundation stone of democracy, um, the basic provider of services, um, and the, the constitution says um, it's supposed to provide democratic and ac accountable government for local communities, sure provision of services, promote social and economic development, promote safety, uh, safe and healthy environment. So these are all very key dimensions of ordinary lives of people. Um, and if municipalities are not performing uh, these functions, clearly uh, the majority of the population will be severely affected by it. Um, what we know at the moment though, is the status, uh, despite their pivotal status, uh, the performance of local governments at the moment is, is poor and um, it is also definitely deteriorating. Um, we have been faced with service delivery protests for much of the last two, at least certainly the last decade, probably decade and a half. Uh, they become part of our daily lives. And then if we look at the latest um, Auditor General's Municipal Finance Act report, um, it makes for very grim reading. And um, I, it says, for example, that the financial position of just over a quarter of municipalities is so dire that there is significant doubt that they will be able to continue operating as a going concern in the near future. I also add that almost half of the other municipalities are exhibiting indications of financial strain, including low debt recovery and inability to pay, pay creditors and deficits. Now, this, this is, is, is a serious indictment uh, on our system uh, of, of government, generally speaking, that um, with all those important functions they're supposed to perform, that nearly half of them aren't really capable of doing it. Um, we have to ask ourselves, you know, are we living up to, to, to the mandate of, of a democratic society that is providing uh, services to historically disadvantaged and oppressed communities? Now, the question always comes up, who is responsible for this? And, and I have to say the public, and I might also add the media, uh, are quick to blame the shortcomings of, of local government um, on inco incompetent officials and uncaring and corrupt uh, councillors. Now, whilst there no doubt are poorly trained officials in some municipalities and corrupt politicians in others, the shortcomings of government as a whole, um, I'm afraid, point to a wider systemic failure in the IGR system. 
And this, I think the minister alluded to this this morning, this includes the roles played by the national and provincial governments, government. Um, this relates in particular to, to uh, the support provided uh, to, to municipalities that are, failings, that are failing and to oversight and, and accountability mechanisms, which are obviously uh, key elements of good governance. Um, we have to ask ourselves seriously why, and I know we've been speaking around these things, but, but, uh, but they, these, these are hard questions that need to be addressed. And um, we can't just keep on uh, doing more of the same. In the case of local government, there's supposed to be three levels of accountability. The first one is the national and provincial government um, with what, whatever mechanisms of oversight they have, particularly the provincial level. They are supposed to have their own oversight structures, for example, in the, in the, um, uh, the role of municipal public accounts committees. Opposition parties are also supposed to play a role in oversight. And then the third one, which we hear constantly, uh, that is the accountability to the general public. In other words, this is the electorate who voted for them um, and who presumably can vote them out of office. Um, but again, th these levels of accountability don't seem to be, to be uh, addressed I mean, or, or functional, should I say. Um, I'd now just like to speak a little bit about local government planning and, and intergovernmental relations. Now, each one of these, to be honest, is, is a top topic uh, of its own, and um, I have to go through them very quickly given the time constraints. Um, many of the things I'm saying are already published in various reports, government's own reports and in academic ones in the media. Um, some of my research was, was founded on a study I did for Cocter about five years ago with a colleague, uh, Greg Reiters, from the School of Government, um, looking at two municipalities, one in the Free State and one in Gauteng, where there were high levels of protest, and trying to, to work out what were the factors that were, were triggering them. Um, and the part of it is that the... the the planning process the, is based on the integrated development plans. Um, and these are supposed to be aligned to other national policies, to annual performance plans of provinces, um, but this doesn't seem to, this alignment doesn't seem to occur. And this is despite a, a plethora of um, intergovernmental fora, which are supposed to improve communications between different levels, different spheres of government. And you know, I, I'm sad to say that it seems that more um, intergovernmental fora aren't going to solve the problems we have. It goes way beyond the possibility of communicating. There's other missing factors in this process. Um, so the top-down process the alignment um, in the study that we did, we looked at the IDPs and, and, and looked at how they aligned to the NDP and there was almost no alignment whatsoever um, uh, between those two uh, documents, the IDP and NDP. Um, and then we looked at the bottom-up process, which is supposed to be through uh, participatory uh, processes. And um, the, here again, the, the, there were major uh, challenges. Um, very, very few members of the population actually take part in the IDP process, and that, that goes across the country. It's seen to be, in terms of the Municipal Systems Act, it, it seems to be a key dimension that citizens must participate in this process. In fact, that that's, that's, is, is, is a fallacy. Uh, even in, in, the, in the, the most uh, active uh, municipalities, which really go out of the way to encourage citizen participation, the number of citizens who actually take part in the IDP process is very, very small. Um, in the two municipalities that we looked at, it was less than 1% of the population. So what, and, and those who do participate generally have vested interests in it um, and are articulate. Um, so the majority of, of citizens in a municipality have no idea what's in an IDP or what it's supposed to deliver. And they also don't know, uh, have no means of measuring progress. Now, there are lots of uh, these um, reports put out. Um, they do do some tracking. It's not to say that they don't. But the plans are, are 
generally, and maybe it's improved now, um, it was five years ago, published in English, available online or in a public library. So this aggravated the sense that ordinary people didn't know what was in those or what, what, how to be able to evaluate whether the municipality was doing what it's supposed to be doing. Um, and then the participatory processes themselves uh, have huge problems, award committees, stakeholder forums, etc. Um, and, and they are largely um, ineffectual and, and ignored. Uh, for example, ward, ward committees themselves um, are very often politicized, but they really uh, they're not you know democratically elected anyway. Um, the ward councillors have very little discretionary funding at their disposal. Um, they also have very little uh, possibility of, of influencing municipal budgets. And, uh, but the problem is they also make commitments they're unable to fulfill. And, and this, as we've seen, leads to anger, frustration, loss of trust in the participatory process, and to, to protest inevitably. Um, so just summarizing, though, uh, what are some of the factors that are contributing to weak uh, planning and, and intergovernmental relations? Well, we do know from many reports, from the Auditor General's ones in particular on financial issues, there is a lack of administrative capacity, uh, and particularly, uh, specifically, a, a lack of financial management skills. Uh, this comes up, I mean, looking at these reports for the last 10 years, and not much has, has changed. The next one, which is the over-reliance on consultants, which actually weakens municipalities. So they never develop their own capacity. They're always relying on, on, on people brought in from the outside who do a quick job. job. Often it's, it's, a, um, it's a cut and paste from somewhere else. And I do remember seeing oh, some years back, but looking at an IDP from, from municipality and somewhere in that document, they had the name of another municipality uh, meaning that they had copied bits from the previous one to put into the one I was reading. Um, and, and generally speaking, the, 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 this, this lack of capacity, I have to say, also extends to, to outsourcing. Uh, there are many functions that municipalities used to be able to do themselves basic functions. Filling potholes. In the past, you would, the municipality would have its own steam roller, steam roller and a team that would go out with tar and fill in the potholes. Now it's set out to tender uh, many places, and it's along these, precisely along these supply chain lines where, where tenderpreneurs and corruption occurs. Um, and then the next one is weak, under-resourced accountability systems and weak monitoring systems. Now, this may be by accident or maybe by design. If you want to get away with nefarious activities, having weak accountability systems and lack of monitoring is precisely what you want. But let us be look at it in the favorable side and say this is just a lack of capacity. But then there's also the fact that councils themselves fail to act on the findings of uh, their own municipal uh, public uh, municipal public accounts committees. They do get feedback from these committees. They are told that things are going wrong, and seemingly they just ignore them. And um, this, uh, this disregard for legislation um, is one that comes up again and again in the Auditor General's reports to say that you, you're infringing Municipal uh, Finance Act, you, you're infringing various other ones, PFMA, and the next year you see the same report. Uh, there seems to be, we heard about it this morning again, there seems to be no consequence for officials or even the, 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 the political, the polity that supports them uh, if they fail to perform this act uh, to, to, to address these problems. And here we, we, we come to a key challenge, and that is to say, I know um, particularly opposition parties would say uh, interventions are used uh, against us in, as a political weapon. Uh, that may indeed occur from time to time. But, but what, what do you do when this party simply do not perform? And I know that, so there is a balance between using the stick, and it cannot be the only tool by any means, and I'm not suggesting it. But there has to be some stick. Uh, otherwise, this, we just continue on this. We repeat, next year we'll be talking about the same thing. Uh, we have heard also today of the problems of political intervention, interference, and certainly in the two municipalities I was involved in, this was a constant theme. 
uh, high excellence of government, particularly provincial government, getting involved in the affairs of local government and dictating what needs to be, uh, what should happen, who should get contracts. Um, and then interference by local politicians um, in the administration and allocation of resources. So the minister also touched on this. The political dimension, unfortunately, is one that is probably going to, is going to have to be resolved by the political systems themselves. Uh, you can legislate as much as you like, but if these matters aren't resolved at a political level, um, uh, you could take it to court, and normally the courts would say political matters must be resolved by political parties. And I must also add that the, uh, the lack of national and provincial support uh, we heard about the equitable distribution of funding is one of them, but much more could also be done uh, in providing support. And that, I think, is an area where there needs to be a lot, of, lot more fo fo focus going forward. And then I repeat it, is this lack of consequences and a lack of accountability. Until that is tightened up, we can expect more of the same, uh, regrettably. And what is to be done? Um, you know, this is not the first time this, this particular set of problems is being addressed. Uh, in, in 2009, we had uh, the local turnabout strategy. Um, 2017, we have the basic back to basic strategy. All of them, both of those and others, by the way, the cocktails that is some of its own interventions as well, others, uh, were in, sense, in essence trying to address the same problem. Perhaps it wasn't framed as much in an IGR context, maybe it was framed more on local government. But any attempt to fix local government has to be within the context of the broader IGR system. We cannot fix uh, local government purely by focusing on local government. Uh, there needs to be a, a complete rethink of, of, our, of our IGR system and our accountability systems um, going forward. Um, as I've already indicated, the constitution does already make uh, considerably a prov provision for quite considerable interventions. Um, um, in the affairs than is probably currently happening at the moment. Um, again, this needs to be matched with, with capacity building. The stick alone won't work here. But I'd also like to put out uh, two more suggestions. Uh, some maybe 20 years ago, I published a paper on, on uh, the case for, um, it was entitled, Does One Size Fit All? Uh, and the case for the asymmetrical devolution of power um, in local government. And uh, I, I float this idea again um, to say, is this not a possibility with underperforming municipalities? When uh, municipalities are placed under administration, some of their functions are already overtaken uh, by, uh, taken over by a provincial government. But the model was of interest to me is derived from Spain, uh, where they have different levels of autonomy uh, at local government level, some almost to complete autonomy um, and others fairly basic autonomy. And basically how this system worked is that municipalities were given a set of targets which they had to achieve over a sustained period of time. So if they had clean audits for three or four years at a time, then a certain amount of power would be assigned to them. If they, if they completed uh, the set of tasks that they said they were going to do in, in, in their plans, more, more authority plus more finance would be assigned to them. Um, in my initial reading of this, um, I felt that maybe there didn't need to be any uh, tweaking of, of, of the constitution. There is still quite uh, a lot of provision for that, but I think it would need a legal person to look into it. But it, it does, and it'd have to be done in negotiation. The NCOP would obviously be critical in this process, as would be Salga. But the point is to say we're not there just to protect the supposed independence of, of, of intergovernment, of, of local government. We, we cannot afford that at the moment. We have uh, an angry population, a poor population that needs uh, services, and, and uh, we cannot continue on the same model that we are on at the moment. Um, the other one is linked to this, and it's derived from the what is known as the All India Service Model. And in this one, officials, competent officials, experienced officials, from national and provincial government, possibly, uh, are seconded to underperforming uh, municipalities, or in their case, states, um, uh, to assist them in developing uh, their competence. And if the right people are, are, are seconded there, um, they can also give a very good insight of what is going on. If there is uh, 
mismanagement of funds, uh, individuals like this would have a better whole handle of what is going on. Um, but but I do think we can't continue with the same ways of doing things we've been doing in the past because we will get the same result. There is a need for a rethink of this and a quite a serious one. And I hope that the this particular workshop and the robust discussions will come out of that uh, will help us on this path. But I, I want to stress once again uh, the need for um, for accountability and consequences is a start. It is not the only thing, but when there is no consequences for corruption mismanagement, again, we must expect it to happen again. Thank you very much. How shame when the prof is yeah. done. Thanks, uh, thanks uh, thank prof. You. And uh, thank you, uh, Honorable Mahai. I don't know whether we go to the second presentation before I allow the members yes. to yes. ask the question. The second presentation will do. Okay. Thanks very much, uh, honorable members. Uh, can we get to the second presentation? Honorable. Um, hmm. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, let me also take the opportunity to acknowledge the chairperson of the NCOP, Bob Masondo, deputy chairperson, chief we present of the NCOP, Dr. Mohai, my minister, Kota, the deputy ministers present there, and of course the president of SALGA, members of NCOP, uh, governors, practitioners present in this session, uh, my daughter, Dr. Mahali, also, and uh, all my colleagues who are participating in this uh, workshop. Um, Chairperson, I also have forwarded a small presentation, but let me first, as a matter of introduction, indicate that uh, we take it for granted that uh, IGR is uh, important in our country. We have not, of course, looked into the pro and cons, but I want to put forth and say yes, uh, coordinated efforts, if that is what IGR is all about, are important and necessary in building a capable state in a young democracy as ours. Let me give by example, Chairperson, to say in America, when um, Detroit, the metro there, uh, was faced with the disinvestment in the motor industry, when Japan took over the Ford uh, company, I think, uh, people lost jobs then. And that uh, brought up a movement that was called the Metro Revolutionary, where metros came together and said, it appears as if there is no need for central government. In their uh, sphere, of course, they were talking about federal government, simply because government failed to put stimulus packages to address the issues of uh, the lost uh, jobs. And uh, that, of course, led to sequence where subsequently, during presidential elections, all the presidents in America have been stressing the point, America first. What that basically uh, entails is America first, jobs first for Americans, vice versa, um, the international uh, companies that have taken uh, your jobs. And uh, that is a lesson basically that says 
yes, we need to have coordinated efforts if we are going to build uh, this country. And two, I think from the lessons of uh, uh, COVID-19, you can imagine, uh, colleagues, if everyone was doing their own thing, where would we be in addressing this pandemic? That's why coordinated efforts are necessary. And in this regard, it's not only internally in the country in terms of IGR, but also, of course, internationally. That's why then uh, H, um, is it WHO is now the tropical um, institution uh, these days. So that basically indicates what uh, I'm trying to say, that coordinated efforts are important and necessary in building our country. As a, a matter of history, we all know that the genesis of cooperative governance and IGR is thus in our constitution. The constitution in terms of section 40 um, indicates the type of uh, government we are having, national, provincial, and local, and it also indicates uh, the relationship there. If we take that journey further, you'll remember that the AGR Framework Act was enacted in 1998. Of course, that was an attempt to guide the sphere of government, how to cooperate. Intergovernmental structures were established in all spheres of government, some which are PCL, C, PCF, PCC, DIGR, and later, of course, provinces also moved to have their own minimax and at local government structures. Salga also assisted municipalities in forming speakers' forums, mayors' forums, municipal managers' uh, forums. These structures also established guidelines on how they engage on matters of common interest. Further, as the IGR and cooperative governance was evolving, other organs of the state, um, for instance, SOEs, were included in the IGR forums. As an example, this, of course, is the involvement of ESCOM in these forums, where all spheres engage in the electricity sector, as it was recognized as the catalyst for economic growth activities at all spheres of life. When it comes to the practice of cooperative governance and IGR, I must indicate that although uh, government has attempted, I mean all the spheres, in advancing IGR and cooperative governance, there are areas that need us to look into. At government level, at the local sphere, we know that we do have IDPs that must ensure that all programs of the three spheres are reflected. Who amongst us, particularly in the NCOP maybe, we have looked into randomly, let's say five IDPs per province from municipalities to see if uh, national provincial programs are reflected in those IDPs. At national level, we have the NDP that seeks to marshal all actions of government departments for a longer time period. And these are reduced into five-year MTS F. But uh, how many times have we looked into the proper benchmark in terms of uh, the NDP and what those MTFs are actually uh, saying? The question that this workshop must answer is whether South Africa has matured enough to say cooperative governance and IGR has realized its mission. I will answer by saying not much really. We still need much to be done in this uh, regard. As I'm saying, we need to have monetary, particularly at, from your sphere, uh, Chairperson, to make sure that we really address some of the issues that have been highlighted 
by other speakers in this forum. For instance, we know that spheres are still operating in silos. As an example, some cases clinics are still built without a road, without the provision of water. I know for one, there was a hospital in Lady Brent in the Free State that took two years before it could be opened simply because later they realized that there was not enough water for that hospital to operate. Uh, that means in two years' time, people were denied good health and health services in that area. Housing and human settlements are still built where connector services are not present, as we know. A number of disparate IGR programs are initiated by various organs of the state, and despite the forums, minimal implementation and impact is realized. Roles and responsibilities of various actors in the IGR space are not fully defined. Sometimes we even um, think that decentralization is equal or equivalent to autonomy, if not uh, federalism, whereas the issue is supposed to be mutual cooperation and mutual respect. I think those are the issues that we really need to look into as we will be considering the issues of this workshop. The current intervention and introduction of the DDM, where, where one plan at the district space is proposed, according to me, is a step in the right direction. The responsibilities of the actors must be thoroughly defined and monitored by not only the executive, but by the legislatures, like the NCOP in this regard. Provisions of reporting requirements are already in place in terms of Section 46, Section 47, Section 48 of the Systems Act. These have been neglected by respective legislatures, and I think we need to go back to those basics and look into those reporting requirements so as we are able to strengthen and tighten on matters pertaining to IGR. In conclusion, um, Chairperson, I would like to say in advancing cooperative governance and IGR, we first need to ensure that we enhance or rather ensure that agreements entered into are implemented. Your ESCOM agreements with municipalities and also agreements with the provinces, municipalities, and including, of course, national. There are examples I can make in this regard, uh, but I think for the exercise, let me just highlight that we need, of course, to ensure that we enhance and we ensure that agreements are implemented. And also, too, we need to establish implementation protocols that binds all involved to play ball in this regard. Three, we need to ensure that legislatures are appraised on progress regarding the implementation of the one plan in all the 46 spaces. I'm referring to districts and metros uh, as the DDM uh, model. And lastly, we need to ensure that the current IGR for forums move away from just cooperation and sharing of programs, but also ensure accountability accountability, accountability of all plans and activities that straddle the spheres of government. For now, Chairperson, that is my take on this uh, topic. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Magnoni, honorable members. We got uh, two presentations, and um, I'm going to take the hands that want to ask the questions or question clarity or contribution. Thank you. Can I see the hands? Uh, 
Jefferson iPhone your rule iPhone. Uh, thanks, honorable members. Uh, Chief Whip, can you come in? Sakuba, Chief Whip, a cousin. Get him high. It's unbelievable that the presentation by Prof. Chris and uh, <laughs> that Emmanuel here, uh, members have been very enthusiastic before before lunch. <laughs> now I do not understand what happened. Uh, <laughs> we have addressed we have addressed the issues, Chairperson. Now, I okay, think, uh, uh, chief people, I wish we are covered. Chief people, we are covered. I, I think, uh, chief people, chief people, on my contribution, I would like to say to Mr. Magnoni, uh, I was very impressed about when he talks about the coordinating effort that uh, is very important uh, for us, and he was also making. Um, example about uh, America in terms of a job. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Magnoni. The Abule Elementary person, thanks. Uh, Chief Whip, there's no hands. I think you can take over. Okay. I... Thanks, thanks, uh, uh, House Chair and Mengwenya, and also let me appreciate since from the morning, uh, the chairperson of the council, and uh, I must indicate as well that uh, some of the members of the National Council of Provinces, unfortunately, uh, could not join us today because of the JSC, uh, interviews that they've started uh, today. Now, and, and specifically, that will be the deputy chair of the NCOP and the house chair of committees and the chair of the the chair of the select committee on, on local government. And I think I'm missing one. There's another member, I think Honorable Muima, chair in the economy cluster. Now, I think I must first of all acknowledge the, 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 the presentations as adding great value in the work of the National Council of Provinces uh, once more. Uh, that it, is, it has been a great, a great effort, a great work that will be left with these uh, well-researched uh, uh, presentations that will serve as reference for us in our work. So this virtual workshop, taking a lead in advancing cooperative governance and intergovernmental relation, has raised a number of challenges which affect local government. Most importantly is the fact that the input by Minister of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs, uh, Dr. Nkosaza Natlamini Zuma, who outlined the legislative framework in which intergovernmental relations function. She also further outlined the different legislative interventions which the department is in a process of consultation and approval by relevant authorities. One of the enriching aspects of this workshop is the different inputs which have been made by different scholars, academic, academics, and local government uh, experts. One of the key issues which has come out across all presentation is the political administrative interface, which borders to some of the challenges which affect the municipalities, which leads to the disregard for the legislation and eroding capacity of local government. The minister emphasized the political parties across all the benches have the responsibility to educate members of executive and legislators in ethics of governance and where they falter, we must act and act fast. 
So that's an important point. I think the the issue that the minister is advocating for, that we should be a working house, uh, not really being more adversarial, chasing one another on non-issues, but we should focus on the substance of the work that we should be doing. Capacity and capability of local government is another area which has resulted to weaken service delivery outcome in many of our communities. IGR, in its philosophical orientation, is about harnessing the unitary state which South Africa is, that the district development model is critical intervention by our government to improve coordination and cooperation within a government to ensure that all government efforts and resources are maximized to make the highest impact. A section 40 of the constitution that was alluded to establishes the three spheres of government that are distinctive, interdependent, and interrelated. It also responds to strengthening planning and budgeting and reinforcement of efforts across government institutions. And, and, the, indiv and the indivisi indivisibility of freedom and nation building is relatable in the spirit and intent of intergovernmental relations see to also enhance that as Honorable Dango outlined, our historic development of separation uh, which disintegrated our communities and their relationship uh, to government, that we need to do more work, work amongst the people to ensure that there is clarity and understanding of the vision of which we espouse. I must say, Chair, that we will indicate uh, 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 tomorrow as well that all of our presenters today, and I want to, to, to say it on behalf of the National Council of Provinces, they have never failed us by prominently raising those critical questions that they have highlighted in their presentation. And through our technical team, we are going to highlight specific issues that requires us to follow on. And I'm happy also to indicate today that quite a number of members of the National Assembly, uh, even including the Deputy Speaker, had followed the discussions uh, and also some of the specific suggestions were made, for instance, on how some of the issues can be handled. So we do not seek to respond to those issues, but through our technical committee, that post workshop, these issues will be taken forward. And that will be witnessed in how the National Council of Provinces conduct its business. So thanks the most uh, to all our uh, presenters uh, today for job well done. Thank you, House Chair. Uh, thanks, uh, Honorable Mohai, Chief Whip. Uh, Chief Whip, uh, I'll ask you also if you do have an announcement and in terms of our session for tomorrow, and any announcement that uh, no, no changes on the program. Us. No changes on the program, House Chair, as the program indicates, we'll start that time. So we'll utilize the program as is. Thanks Thank very you. much, uh, Chief Whip. Uh, honorable members, thanks very much. Uh, the session of today uh, is adjourned. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Research.
Recording stopped. Uh, Mr. Powers, uh, Mr. Angola. Good. Good. Uh, uh, say anything. Nothing from my side. Okay, we'll use the same link tomorrow. Huh? Yeah, yes, nothing.